Happy New Year, everyone. This is Matt from License to Watch, here once again to tell you about our Patreon. For just $1 a month, that's right, just one single dollar, you get to subscribe to our Patreon show. And while you're there, you will get bonus movies. That's right, we cover non-franchise classics like Twister, Cliffhanger, Rudy, Star Trek Next Generation films, Dune, Scarface, and Scrooged. It's great, and it's simple. All you do is go to patreon.com slash L2W and subscribe today. You'll get a special link called an RSS feed that you just plug into whatever you use to listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. You plug it in, and it pops right up, just like all your other podcasts that you listen to. So check it out. Go to patreon.com slash L2W and pledge your $1 a month right now so you can start getting bonus content. You know you love it. I love it. We all love it. You love the show. Go there now. Patreon.com slash L2W. Come on, people. Do it now. Happy New Year. When Shane Black wrote Lethal Weapon in 1985, he didn't know he was launching a blockbuster action franchise, creating the definitive buddy cop movie, or beginning one of the most lucrative screenwriting careers Hollywood had ever seen. Fresh out of UCLA film school, he just really needed rent money. His original vision was an urban western set in present-day Los Angeles and featuring a hyper-violent suicidal cop and his overworked everyman partner. The first draft was so grim and excessive, Black nearly threw it out. But the second draft sold to Warner Brothers for a respectable $250,000. Veteran action producer Joel Silver and Superman director Richard Donner were brought on board to help Black smooth out the rough edges. Australian heartthrob Mel Gibson had gained Hollywood's attention after appearing in a pair of Peter Weir films, The Year of Living Dangerously and Gallipoli. And his performance as Max Rokotansky in the Mad Max movies proved his action chops. Danny Glover was primarily a theater actor who had a good reputation as a dependable professional, and was coming off a major role in Steven Spielberg's Oscar-nominated film, The Color Purple. Despite neither actor being a recognizable name, they were both flown in to screen test together. Within 15 minutes, they were joking around like old friends, and Donner and Silver had found their leads. Helped by a glowing four-star review from critic Roger Ebert and positive word of mouth, the film grossed $120 million off a $15 million budget, catapulted Gibbs into stardom, and launched what many people consider to be one of the all-time great action franchises. But how do we feel about this series? That's why you're here. So get ready to find out. Tease and feather out that mullet, Eat a big-ass birthday cake in your bathtub and get ready to rumble mano y mano on your suburban front lawn because we're about to dive into the first of four movies in a brand new series. We watched Shane Black and Richard Donner's action film classic, 1987's Lethal Weapon. This is a show about franchises. Action movie franchises. You're listening to License to Watch. Why in the world was this movie made? show this is license to watch um this is a very special episode because we're starting a new franchise we're no longer talking about the exorcist that's behind us um today we are talking about the great 80s classic film series or 80s and 90s i should say uh but it starts in the 80s lethal weapon joining us today is our special guest mr carl tart he's a, a writer and comedian he's worked on um comedy bang bang and Brooklyn Nine Nine, you may have heard of that. Um, so yeah, welcome. Thanks, Carl. man. Thank you for having me, y'all. I really appreciate it. Hey, Carl. Yeah. Oh, hey. So, um, have you met Reggie Watts since you worked on Comedy Bang Bang? Yeah, I met Reggie Watts. He's yeah. a cool, dude. I once technically opened for him. <laughs> That's sick. How was <laughs> really? that experience? Was the audience was the audience into it? Um, no, so no, let him finish. I think it was he opened a bathroom door for him. Oh. <laughs> <And> <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> so uh, this one time I used to live in this place um, with like a bunch of different like artists and people like that. And my friend Anna, she's like, hey, Colin, you can sing, right? And I'm like, I am able to sing. Yes, sure. And <laughs> the she's same like, way that well, anyone can sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's like, well, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> um, I need you to come with me to this thing. I have this friend. He's this guy. He's doing like a, a comedy thing where... He has a song, and it's like, I don't remember what the song was. It was like pervy. It was like about balls or spooge or something. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, he's like, at the end of the song, like a whole chorus of people is going to come out of the back, and we're all going to be singing along with the song. And like, and I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and so um, I was like, I don't really know if you want me to do this. I don't know if I'm good enough. And she's like, well, we're, you know, you get, you, get, um, you get free cover. And it's Reggie Watts. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go see Reggie Watts. Um, so I went there and, uh, you know, I got to go in the green room and get one of my favorite experiences in life is like being in the green room with you when you just barely qualify to be in the green room, um, <laughs> which I love. Uh, uh, and, um, yeah, I went out there and I sang the song. So I got to go on stage for like 30 seconds just to a standing ovation. And then um, I always forget the guy's name. Um you know the guy who's in Deadpool, and he's also in the beginning seasons of Silicon Valley, the redheaded guy? T.J. Miller? Yeah, T.J. Miller. And then it was him, and then it was uh, Reggie Watts. And Reggie Watts was doing, like, he was just, like, working on material and stuff. And he did several minutes about how, he, living in L.A., he wants to start jogging. Because <laughs> jogging in L.A. is harder because the air quality is so bad. And it was, I, I love when people are, like, working on material because, like, then you know it's just his delivery is is making it work. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that green room, that description of a green room is so real. Like when you <laughs> when you're like when you go into a green room, you're like, I shouldn't be in here, and yet I have access. Yeah, that's the best. Like, I because it made me think of um like there were times <laughs> there were times back uh like when I was in college and stuff where like I'd be in the green room for like with a band or something playing a small show at like a small club and it'd be like the only real qualification or talent I have to be in this green room is like being willing to smoke weed with someone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My green room story is uh, I'm a big basketball fan. Harris knows this. We talk about it a lot and we also play together mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully, I, hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. I know. I can't wait, man. I'm I'm gonna be real <laughs> sluggish. Not that yeah. not that I wasn't before. But, <laughs> but even more so. Uh, yeah. Even more sluggish. <laughs> but um I so I was supposed to do a, a character bit in one of Blake Griffin's comedy shows, because he's a comedian as well as a basketball player. And um they cut they cut the bit late, like real late in the in the in the game like Blake didn't want to do it. it was me playing LeVar Ball and I was doing a bit as LeVar Ball and he was like I don't want to make fun of this kid's dad and Lakers it's, he plays on the Lakers that was when when Lonzo was still on the Lakers and, and he's like I don't want to do that so they cut the bit and they was like hey so you're not gonna do the bit but you can still come to the show and you still got all your privileges like all your backstage <laughs> privileges and so I'm like cool like so I get two backstage pads I invite my homeboy and I'm like oh this will be fun like go to Blake Griffin comedy show hang out get some free drinks in the back so I pull up, and at first we're like waiting outside. We get to bypass this huge line, which is always cool. That's always dope when they're like, "Oh yeah, you you come up here, you stand over here." And we get in, we see the guys who wrote uh, on the other bits on the show, and they're like, "Yeah, all right, cool. We're gonna go down to the green room." And so we're walking down to the green room. I walk into the green room. First person I see sitting on the couch, and it's a tiny green room. It's at the, I don't know if y'all have ever been to the Argyle Theater. It's it's like right on Hollywood and. Oh. Uh, Vine, I guess. Yeah. And it's like that theater right there. And um, so we walk in. First person I see sitting on the couch, like five feet away from me, Kendall Jenner. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's tight. Like, yeah. that's Kendall Jenner. <laughs> I nod and wave. She smiles and kind of, you know, we don't we don't talk or anything. And then Blake walks down and he says something. He's like, oh, what's up, man? You're supposed to be doing the uh, the LeVar bit. Sorry I had to cut that, but you, you get it. And I'm like, oh, it's all good, man. Like, just happy to be here. And I'm chilling. I'm thinking this is going to be the night. I'm like, cool, man. Dope night. I got to see Blake Griffin and Kendall Jenner. And then come walking down the stairs is DeAndre Jordan in a long kimono, seven feet tall in a kimono. <laughs> and uh, Wesley Johnson, who just got crossed over real bad by James Harden like and fell. Then T-Mac walks in. And then all the Clippers walk in. And I'm like, this is the greatest night of my life. 
And I'm just chilling in here with <laughs> yeah. these guys. I'm just hanging out, drinking free drinks. And it didn't feel like I didn't belong because I knew a couple people who knew people, you know. And so I was able to, like, join conversations. But I'm like, I am. This is my starstruck. Standing in a tiny room mm-hmm. with the L.A. Clippers. Like, yeah. I'm a huge Clipper fan, number one. And T-Mac is in there, too. He never played for the Clippers, but he's still a legend. T-Mac like, is, is shockingly uh, tall, too. Did you did you see that? Like, I mean, that's tall thing. Whenever big. I've seen him in person, I've always been like, damn, he's like almost seven feet tall. And yeah. he just never looked, because of the position he played, you never thought of him that way. But he's a, yeah. a huge dude. And he's his retirement tall. weight. He's got his retirement weight on. He's just yeah. a big block yeah, of a yeah, exactly. human yeah. being. Like, he's <laughs> well, that's when he, when he had that season with the Spurs, I remember just thinking, this a, he could have played power forward, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. He had that build. <laughs> Yeah, I um, love T-Mac growing only, up. I was a big fan. The only green room story that I have is I used to work for The Tonight Show when Jay Leno still hosted. And uh, I used to – they had a green room, but it was, like – it was for, like, guests. It was, like, a scummy green room. I just remember, like – I never saw anyone famous or, or good in there. <laughs> it was always, like, you know, <laughs> if he had, like – he had, like, friend, you know, friends of the guests and stuff would hang in there. And I remember, like, just seeing, like – Guys with mustaches and like, yeah. <laughs> and like, this is I remember exactly seeing... what we're talking about. You were seeing exactly what Colin's yeah. talking about—the guy who doesn't yeah. belong there, who's there anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, legend has it uh, that the right mustache can get you into any green room. Yeah, <laughs> instead of holding up a badge, you just like point to your mustache. It's like, excuse me, have you seen my facial hair, ma'am? Right this way. Oh yes, sir. You belong. <laughs> the guy who plays Hunsucker in Lethal Weapon has such a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like, this guy must be in charge of something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. That's a good segue. <laughs> Let's start talking about Lethal Weapon. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, this movie's a bit tainted by Mel Gibson and, like, what he became. But let's bring ourselves back to a world in which his outbursts never happened. You know, this is 1987. Hmm. This is another uh, another world, a world long forgotten. I I kind of I was thinking about this when I was watching it. I was like, for some reason, I cannot watch a new Mel Gibson movie. Like every time I do, I just like I can't. I just can't look at him without thinking, God, what a fucking asshole! Like Fat it, Santa or whatever the fuck. Movie yeah, he's like in anything now. he does. Yeah, Is that like real? Now he's playing in yeah, uh, crime fighting Santa like Claus or whatever. It's <laughs> just I I just can't watch any new Mel Gibson without thinking like, for me, he's kind of canceled. But it's not retroactive because I watch old Mel Gibson stuff and I'm like, oh, he's funny and charming. And I remember, th- I remember this Mel Gibson. He was like America's sweetheart. You know, this is a great guy. Um, yeah. And it's just so bizarre that I can sort of compartmentalize that when I watch Lethal Weapon, Martin Riggs is totally different than the Mel Gibson that I kind of, you know, and am, am annoyed by and kind of disgusted by often now. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think the reputation is that, you know, at the time when when Lethal Weapon was at its height and popularity and stuff the i think the a lot of people would say that gibson was the one kind of carrying it i don't really agree with that i i like danny glover better um because after watching it now i well i already like danny glover better just because i like danny glover because he was predator too i guess i don't know why but uh in terms of this movie i think you could say that the reason Danny Glover might be carrying it more than the reason Mel Gibson is carrying it performance-wise is because Danny Glover is doing a lot more of the listening, and listening is harder as an actor. That's my you case. You think Mel Gibson's just showboating? He's got the show he's got the show your part for sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that showboating son of a bitch. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that uh, Gary Busey carries this movie. Well, <laughs> that, that argument could be made. Well, everyone knows that Gary Busey is a secret <laughs> weapon of this movie. What is the yeah. story with Gary, Gary Busey? He's like a really is he a really good actor? Like how is Gary Busey how do we know Gary Busey? Yeah, where did it start, right? Is what you're asking kind of. I've seen DC Cab. I'm sure y'all have seen that. Yeah. I have not seen but, that. Oh, you should watch. We should DC definitely Cab. put that on our potential <laughs> list for bonus episodes. <laughs> DC Cab definitely should be on that list. That's a Joel Schumacher flick. <laughs> I don't know. I just know Mr. T was in it at Marshall yeah. Warfield. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Exactly. T's in it. I, I'm Mr. on board. T's like Mr. T's like got a significant part. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Um, and Bill Maher, young, a very young Bill Maher. Really? Yeah. What? And uh, he, he says and, as if that's a, an appealing. I'm Come sorry, on, is, y'all! I know y'all. Bill, I know y'all in now. I know y'all in now. Is, is Bill Maher playing a character, or is he playing Bill Maher? He's playing a character. This was his first film, I think. But like, he's not he an just actor. Like, 
Well, he was like a club comic, and you know they added yeah, he, comics to exactly. movies. You know those okay. like Jay okay. Moore and guys like that. They're all they all came up uh-huh. as comics and then started being actors. And then people were like, "Eh, maybe acting isn't your thing." And then they become <laughs> talk show hosts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, this brings it around to I mentioned Jay Leno before. He actually did um, a buddy cop movie after this came out with uh, Pat Morita from yep. Karate Kid. Yeah. <laughs> I forget what it's called. It's got a stupid name. That, like that was like def- that, that's exactly what we're talking about the Jay Leno version of the hey I'm a stand up comic and now I'm gonna be an actor and then everyone's like yeah. no you're better as not an actor um, yeah, it's okay. called like Crash Course or something like that or Defensive Driving yeah <laughs> it's something having to do with driving I yeah I think that um, I believe that DC Cab was might have been near the low point of um, of uh, Gary Busey's career because he was like sort of the young hot actor for a while in random shit like Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and you know he, he had like sort of smaller parts I think he was in the 76 A Star is Born um, and Straight Time but like then he got nominated for an Oscar for playing Buddy Holly in the Buddy Holly story and his career yeah. like blew up and I think it was like too much too soon because he just did a string of you know not so recognizable things I think Silver Bullet is the only thing that I could even remember Isn't- in that Stretch. Isn't Point Break like the thing people really know him for? Well, no, Point Break's after this. This was his comeback oh, yeah, movie. Yeah. Okay. okay. This, this was, was his comeback, comeback movie. He did this, Predator 2, and Point Break, basically, you know. And, oh, and of course, Under Siege. Um, and those Under were like Siege, yeah. four huge hits that sort of revitalized his career. The movie you were talking about was called Collision Course. I looked it up. Collision Course, <laughs> I told you. Yeah. <laughs> And DC Cab was directed by Joel Schumacher. If you can say anything bad about Lethal Weapon, it's that it made everyone think that everything should be a buddy cop movie, and just like mm-hmm. just we're just gonna put this person and this person. It's it's a uh, you know like a, a guy and a dog. You know like we had multiple buddy cop movies about a cop and a dog. That's how dumb they it literally is. did that several that, times. Yeah. That is like what I think of when I think of Lethal Weapon usually is like making buddy cop into like a formal format you know like yeah a template uh an outline something you know like yeah. it, it wasn't the first because 48 hours came out several years before mm-hmm. and that was sort of the first and even that was just borrowing the same kind of thing from like butch cassidy and the sundance kid and stuff like that um but it was definitely the one that like sort of codified buddy cop as a successful genre and you know um, and led to, I mean, the Simpsons even spoofed this with like, I think in the Mel Gibson was a guest in the Simpsons episode where Homer writes a script about a cop, a time traveling cop and his partner who's a talking pie. Um, <laughs> that sounds so good. Which, <laughs> which, you know, there was a time when that pitch would have gotten you in a room in, in Hollywood. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> it's lethal weapon with a pie. <laughs> <laughs> it's die hard. It's in die a hard in a bakery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, have you guys seen Loaded Weapon One? <laughs> yeah, I've I seen have, that. But it's been so long. <laughs> it's been so long, but I remember like certain things that I remember. Like, there's a part where they look down a manhole and they see a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sam Jackson, ain't it? That's Samuel yep. L. Jackson, right? Yep. Is that yeah. his Samuel first Jackson movie? Jackson and Emilio Estevez. His first movie might be Exorcist Three, which we've covered on this show recently. Oh, he yeah. has like a cameo bit thing. Um, but then he, what was the other movie he did that year? Like Superfly or something? Yeah, Superfly. Uh, uh, so Superfly. Oh, that oh that weird eighties Superfly that nobody's yeah. ever seen. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah, and he was kicking around in like small things and like you know he was he was the mugger and coming to America and yeah, you know just random stuff. He sort of was around in the vicinity of breaking out for a while. Um, but yeah, I think Loaded Weapon One was like definitely one of his first kind of breakout roles because if he had already broken out, there's no way he would have taken that fucking gig. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so I mean, how, how do you guys want to tackle this movie? What should we should we just jump right into it, uh, plot wise? Um, I I wanted I want to bring up something that precedes <laughs> even the plot. Um, oh, okay, wow. I I want to talk about I want to just talk about the uh, the music first. Specifically, did any of you guys know that there is a band called Honeymoon Suite, and they sang a song called Lethal Weapon that is so it's fucking in the emo. but the best thing is i didn't want to wait for the credits so i looked it up and played the youtube clip which is their music video which is hilarious because they are like such a um like a hair bandy kind of group but the opening shots of this very emo song are all the shots of either riggs crying or riggs standing in the rain in this movie (laughs) 
and it's just like clips <laughs> of Riggs crying or standing in the rain out of context, and it is so hilarious. And the song is yeah. awful. <laughs> the song is awful. <laughs> are are um, we going to talk about the saxophone more? Um, we I think should. it'd be. Yeah, I think it'd be a really uh, interesting way to torture someone if there was some way you could force the uh, the saxophone score into their life. Like, you've just got to live <laughs> your normal life, but you've always got those little saxophone things going on. Because, like, at first, it'd be like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then eventually it'd be like, oh, well, I don't really notice it anymore. But then after that, it would be like, please, end this. In this, you know, every time you every time you leave a room or like <laughs> yeah. it's like a scene ends and all of a sudden the saxophone comes in, <laughs> and like only you can hear it, and everyone else is just living their life and they're just expecting you to be a normal person, and then you, you just that saxophone just keeps coming. Of course, I think I think if that was the reality, Tart was Tart would be the only one of us that would get a saxophone. We'd all get the the electric guitar because that is the division. <laughs> yeah. here. It's, like, it's like the black guy gets the saxophone, the white guy gets the electric guitar. <laughs> Now, I don't yeah. know how old y'all are, but I may be the youngest in here, and I have to keep saying I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Tart, um, what's your like? We usually start by asking the guests like, what is their connection to this movie? Like, you know, a lot of times they've never seen the movie before; or they've seen it a thousand times. Like, I, I mean, these movies are pretty old. Have you? I'm, I'm guessing you've seen them all. I've or at like least this one. I've seen the only one I ever saw in the movies was Lethal Weapon 4, I want to say. Mm-hmm. The one with Chris Rock and Joe Pesci, I yep, think. Yep, same here. So, so I saw <laughs> that one in the movies. I I think they would play this one on, like, TBS and stuff. That was the Today was the first time that I, like, sat down and watched it, like, mm-hmm. from tip to toe. And you were on the Lethal Weapon TV show, is that right? Yeah, I was. And uh, so you didn't do any preparation for it by, like, watching the first movie? Nah, man, what I did, I had an under five. <laughs> There's a cop that comes in and go, "Hey, man," <laughs> and then like it's like that's it, like oh shit. It's like preparation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? Why prepare, prepare if for you that? Can do stuff for if you can get Who paid for nothing. I? Who <laughs> for am I? Who am I? I'm gonna watch this film to see which cop am I. Yeah, but what's exactly. funny is the one detective that comes in to his office in the very beginning. The diehard guy. Yeah, I've been yeah. roasted. Uh, <laughs> I've been roasted in my life being like, "You look like that dude." So, because he played a he played a gangbanger, uh, uh, he played a a Mexican gangbanger in Colors. Yep. And, yeah. <laughs> yep. And I that never is, understood that. That yeah. actor's <laughs> name, by the way, is Grand L. Bush, and we have talked about him not once but twice in this show because he was. <laughs> I in was going to say three times. He, I thought it was. He was three. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> he was in The Exorcist Three. He was in License to Kill, which we've done both of those, and he's also we've talked about him multiple times, just mentioning the Johnsons in Die Hard. Um, and then, like like you said, he was in Colors. Like, talk about a guy who didn't make a lot of movies and never had a big role, but everything he did was just solid fucking gold. <laughs> like, yeah. what yeah. is his life? <laughs> yeah, I mean, his name is Grand Bush. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I've I've been roasted in my life. Hey, you like this guy? You like the dude from Colors? And so <laughs> it was funny. I probably should have watched it and saw how he interacted with. But my my part in the TV show was definitely not that big. But do you just want to be like imitating Grand L. Bush? Do you want to just everyone accusing you of being a Grand L. Bush knockoff? You want to bring your own your own sort of you know tartness to the role? You know that's <laughs> hilarious, man. You Grand L. Bush ripoff. Yeah, you great. You great value, Grand L. Bush. Everybody's like, Googling get off my set. Yeah. You're like a, a hundred L. Bush. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> private selection, Grand L. Bush. <laughs> Kroger brand. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, should we summarize the plot? Okay. We usually summarize the plot in two minutes, just to get it out of the way, so we don't have to go beat by beat. Is this this is Colin, right? Actually, I think it's supposed to be me. Oh yeah, I'm totally it unprepared is for to be it. You, you're right. Yeah, it is supposed to be Matt. <laughs> yeah. All right, Matt. Uh, I could give it a shot. It's gonna be bad. I'm gonna say that right now. All right, you ready? Yep. And go. All right, so Jingle Bell Rock starts this movie off. We see the city of L.A. It's beautiful in all its glory. Uh, the, the real opening shot of the movie is a uh, beautiful half-naked woman with her boobies hanging out, and she's fucked up, she's high on cocaine, there's pills everywhere. Uh, she gets up, and she looks off the balcony of the top floor of the hotel she's on, and she jumps off, she dies. Uh, first up, we meet Martin Riggs, and he's a crazy cop with a feathered mullet. Yeah, uh, he smokes while he sleeps naked. Uh, he lives in a van down by the river, or rather, an RV down by the beach, and he's got a dog who he severely neglects for 95% of the movie. Um, 
his wife died in a car accident three years ago, we learn, and he's really sad about that. Um, he tries to, or he puts a gun in his mouth, and he cries. Um, let's see. Then we meet uh, Roger Murtaugh, who is 50. He's a cop. And we know this. We, it's his birthday. We know this because his family busts in on him in the bathtub, and there's no bubbles, um, so they're seeing everything. Uh, he has a weird relationship with his hot older daughter, who every time he interacts with, we hear the saxophone, and he seems really flustered to like talk to her. You're not doing too good. You're only like. 20 I know. Years, I know. <laughs> uh, so they, they become partners, and uh, they're mismatched. Uh, it's a classic mismatch, and. Uh, so they investigate the murder of this woman. Uh, so it turns out that Murtaugh knows the her dad, who's been trying to contact him, and he's been trying to warn him about, or trying to get help with this um, this group that he's involved with, the like Shadow League or whatever the fuck they're called. And uh, it's run by Je Je General McAllister, who's a really forgettable bad guy. Um, but the real bad guy is his second command, who is uh, Gary Busey. His name is Mr. Joshua and he can withstand uh, a small flame longer than a normal man can. Um, <laughs> uh, what else? So they go to the pimp's house of the girl, and uh, they start shooting. They start getting shot at immediately, and they kill the guy, and he falls in the pool. Um, then Mel Gibson uh, tries to save a guy on a rooftop who's trying to commit suicide. He jumps off with him. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, what happens next? Floating house. Oh yeah, they go back to like find the the other prostitute, and uh, her house explodes, and a bunch of kids across the street like are not phased by it whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> they interview one of the kids, and uh, he says he recognizes the tattoo on Mel Gibson's arm, which is ridiculous. How could he have seen that? Very small. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he probably had a shirt on. I'm guessing if he was dressed as like a repairman or whatever. And it was, was a licking stick uh, tattoo too. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they kind of figure out who these people are, and uh, they kidnap Danny Glover's daughter, and they tell them to meet in the desert, and they go there, and they think Mel Gibson is dead because they shot him, but he was wearing a bulletproof vest. And uh, they try to get the jump on them, but no, the bad guys are really smart, and they, they kidnap both of them, plus uh, Danny Glover's daughter. They torture everybody, but then uh, Riggs kills a guy by breaking his neck with his legs uh, all hell breaks loose they chase the bad guys and they kill the general and then they chase Gary Busey back to Murtaugh's house where Riggs and Gary Busey get into fisticuffs and everybody watches all the cops totally unrealistic but it's awesome and then they both shoot him dead at the end and everybody's okay in the end Matt have you ever done a summary before nice. <laughs> no, you, that this, was my first one. This might have been the worst two-minute summary ever, <laughs> only because it lasted about six minutes. Yeah, it was about twice the amount of yeah, time. Yeah, I completely forgot that I was supposed to do it until like three seconds before the show started. Yeah, so. that's always a bad strategy. Well, you got it. Yeah. It was all very thorough. Um, <laughs> not terribly concise. <laughs> okay, here's something I wanted to ask about. Did you, did anyone notice this? When uh, Murtaugh pulls up to the um, hotel room where the woman jumped out of the, uh, the building, right? Um, there's just like, you know, police chatter going on on his police radio. And what the, what they're talking about is the report of a, Nude woman, 350 pounds at the corner of Melrose and Vine, singing on the street. And he just, like, shuts the door and gets out, and the film moves on. But <laughs> That's just L.A. That? <laughs> Weirdos just in L.A. day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, That's it's funny. for people who don't live here, Colin. Like, for us, we hear that, and we're like, that's just boring everyday yeah. stuff that happens here but if you don't live here and you need to know the like the lay of the land that's how they sort of get that local color in mm -hmm. yeah melrose and vine got it <laughs> <laughs> i really enjoyed uh location scouting in this movie like yeah. seeing things and like i know what that is i know what that is and it also pissed me off at times which i'm sure we'll get to i don't know how, like if y'all do a breakdown of scene by scene but they ha they they ended up certain places that i was like you wouldn't have got there that quick yeah, like, oh, yeah. but that's only for oh, la absolutely. people <laughs> well, the uh, the hotel we're talking about is actually in Long Beach. It's the only thing that's not actually in like L.A. proper, kind of, and they just kind of cheat it to make it like seem like that. I think that's why on the radio they say Melrose and Vine when he pulls up to that building to make it feel more like that building is in L.A. Yeah, I thought what I was amazed at um, as somebody who lives here is 
they shot a lot of stuff sort of, you know, like I'm currently in the process of moving from one side of Koreatown to the other. And I'm actually moving just like a block away from the Wiltern, um, which was, of course, in this movie um, when they're getting hot dogs or whatever. And uh, (laughs) and so but I, I was noticing in a lot of the scenes, I was just like, oh, man. Koreatown looks pretty much the same as it did in 1987. Like whenever they were, I could tell when they were in sort of my neighborhood because I was like, yeah, this looks just like my neighborhood looks now. Uh, When they go to the prostitute's house and it blows up, that looks like the exact area there. Like, what did he say? Like 111th Street or something like that? Like, and Larch. That's in Lenox. That's like uh, Inglewood. That's all that area is about to be turned into the new Clippers arena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but that is what it looks like. It's like the it's like those those small houses that kind of yeah. are s- spread out a little bit, and yeah, um, and and a bunch of black kids who are all dressed by a costume designer. Like this one's in a fringe jacket, and this one has three D <laughs> yeah. shades. That's when you drive through that yeah. neighborhood. That's what it all is everywhere. It's just like they have different colors on, you know, and like different. <laughs> you know, they got one kid with an afro. They're all very distinct. <laughs> Um, it's like a classic 80s thing. It's to always have, like, one of the side kids who, like, doesn't say much, like, have 3D glasses on or, like, yeah. some kind of They had the main kid in the 3D glasses this one. That was, they were yeah. shaking it up. They were like, we're going to have the main kid. We know it's usually the sidekick. In this one, it, the main kid wears 3D glasses, and this other sidekick kid, he's going to wear a fringe leather Western jacket for some reason. And this other one's going to be wearing <laughs> this other one's going to be wearing a sweater in the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're all latchkey kids whose parents don't give a fuck like literally the houses are fucking exploding and like no one cares it's just like another day <laughs> that was some costume designer who, who showed up to set and was like oh i've got the kids dressed in the cutest little outfits and, and somebody was like somebody who actually lives in la is like what the f-? and no no she's really excited about it just let her have this one <laughs> especially them kids over there wait do you have a different pair of 3d glasses i like this pair of 3d glasses but we also brought this pair of 3d glasses can you can we, <laughs> can we do something other than 3d gl- no or do something other than 3d glasses no no way nothing what, it's gotta be 3D glasses. i don't know if we have it in the budget to buy another box of cereal <laughs> <laughs> I like that Murtaugh's house is, like, under construction, but they never really address it. But, and then they just fuck up his house, like, constantly. Like, at the end, the police car drives through, and then, like, two scenes later, they're having dinner at his house, and, like, it's, yeah. like, nothing happens. And I it's feel like, like this carp. is kind of, this kind of beca- I guess we'll see, but I, I feel like if memory serves, this is a recurring theme of the series, is that Murtaugh's house is always kind of semi-under construction, which I think is really I accurate, because so. I grew up in one of those houses, that was always like there was always a project. police cars drove through it. Well, there was no, there was always, but there was always like a wall that wasn't supposed to be there. That was just two by fours. That was someday going to be a wall or that was going to not be a wall anymore, but was always in flux sort of or a basement that was half finished and half unfinished and just never really got all the way finished. Did you know his wife, Darlene Love, who, you know, sing the Christmas song? Uh, she's a product of Phil Spector. Oh really? Yeah, one of the people he was held held captive. Groomed. <laughs> oh yeah. wow! Yeah. Did you ever watch that movie? Who who was that? Was the that Pacino, Pacino movie? Who did it? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever watch that one? I like oh, yeah. that movie. I think this is going to be an interesting thing to look back on retroactively the the biography phase of Pacino's career where he just played like Joe Pa and uh, Phil Spector. Yeah. Just like if the, if yeah. somebody offered him a biography, he was just like, "Is it a real person? I'm in. <laughs> I'm in." <laughs> That's like Tom Hanks. It's like, is he a, an American hero? I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that? What was the the Scorsese one? The the latest one. He's a real person in that too, right? Which one? Oh, the film the, directed by Martin. Right. Scorsese. Oh, are you talking about the Irishman? The one that's like four yeah. days long. Yeah, the Irishman. Yeah, he's Jimmy. Yeah, Hoffa. he's Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, he's a real person in that. <laughs> Where too. Where somehow they de-aged him by like <laughs> by like forty years, and he still looked way too old. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the de-aging in that movie is not good. Yeah. Um, oh, did you I notice it... that? Um, oh, yeah. Did you notice that Danny Glover's son Nicholas? He looks really a lot like Tyler the Creator. <laughs> I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that. <laughs> he looks a lot like him. Can we start that rumor that it actually is Tyler the Creator? What? Yeah, I I would want to start that. Maybe it's the same kid from Exorcist Three because I said the same thing about the kid from Exorcist Three that he looked like Tyler the Creator. <laughs> Maybe it's the same kid. <laughs> It could be. It's the same time. I mean, Grandel Bush is in both movies, so <laughs> yeah. maybe maybe they're a package deal. Maybe Grandel Bush is like, yeah, this kid's with me. <laughs> you find a part for him. 
who creates the creator. You know? So, uh, what do you guys think of Murtaugh's daughter and the whole, like, I feel like every time she was on screen with him, he would act all, like, flustered in the beginning. You know, I, I, like, I got oh, it. She is like pretty. a heartbreaker. I, I got, I understood that what we were supposed to be thinking was that he's, like, realizing his daughter is, you know, in her teens and is going to be dating and is, you know, awakening sexually and all this stuff. And he's getting flustered because he doesn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. But what it, but you're right. There was like an element of like, is he like flirting with his daughter and getting flustered by it? There's like this weird <laughs> yeah. vibe there. And part of it might be the fact that Danny Glover was 40 playing 50 in this movie and his daughter mm-hmm. was 25 playing 15. So they were actually like pretty close in age, <laughs> you know, like they were not that far off, which might have been contributed to the weirdness a little bit. That reminds me. Do you know how old Mel Gibson was when he filmed this? Uh, 30. He was fucking 30. He looks so much older. Yeah, he looked old as hell. But yeah. keep in mind, too, that this was like basically the beginning of his, his career. And think about like how long his career lasted. And he didn't really break out till he was 30. That's kind of like crazy, right? Like that, that gives me hope as a 40 year old to be like, well, Mel Gibson didn't do anything until he was 30 and he's in an industry where he has to depend on his youth and looks, you know, nobody cares what I look like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he did the Mad Max movies and stuff before this. Yeah. Right? But that didn't, and Mad Max didn't get him anywhere in, you know, like Mad Max didn't make him, nobody knew him in America. Not even beyond Thunderdome. You, you know, the, you know what the problem with those movies was they didn't take him to his max potential. That's a, um, a, a Carl Tart. I've got a question for you. <laughs> I've got a question for you. This is a, sort of a comedy question since you are the first person we've ever had on this podcast who actually gets paid to be funny. Um, <laughs> in your average like repertoire, in your comedy toolbox, would you say that puns take up like seventy five percent of your <laughs> comedy toolbox, or or less than Higher? like five? <laughs> uh, if you do a pun, uh, you get jumped. <laughs> so I, we you go to comedy jail. Yeah, we we right. stay we stay away from puns because everybody in the writers' room just slowly closes <laughs> their laptop and turns off the lights and locks the doors. Here's the problem. I think Colin would actually appreciate that reaction. <laughs> yeah, he would actually think he yeah. succeeded in some way if he got the entire room to shut down because of his terrible pun. <laughs> yeah, my, I'm. What I'm wondering is if I do enough of them when no one's around, will they try to come find me? <laughs> <laughs> well, Look, we're doing I... that experiment right here on this podcast <laughs> nobody is around and you're doing a lot of them <laughs> i have to ask y'all i have to ask y'all the this relationship that we were just talking about between the daughter and and Murtaugh, first of all now <laughs> i like i grew up with a family I guess it was pretty private. Like, my grandma would, like, ask me to bring her a roll of toilet paper if she was using the bathroom or something, but it wasn't, like... The whole family, did they have to give him that <laughs> birthday cake while he was butt-ass <laughs> naked in the tub? And it's not like he's He in doesn't a attempt bathroom. to hide. No, he ain't, he, and nothing he, is hidden. His whole no meat bubbles. is out. Nope. They're seeing it all. And, just... and, and then the, the older daughter, like, stayed and was like, your dad... And like gave him more kids, and I'm like, this is inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and this is yeah. probably this might this might be the reason why it seems weird even later in more innocent scenes. It seems weird because she stays behind and is like nibbling on his ear while he's naked in the bathtub, and his schwanz is floating around <laughs> on the surface of the water there. And it's like it's just a weird situation, you know? It's like not a great. Uh, but then again, I don't know. Like so, I will just since you asked, I will just say in my family. I remember my dad, like, coming out of the shower naked when I was, like, a pretty little kid. He would just, like, come out of the shower. Because, you know, it was, like, I'm the oldest, and it was him and just him and my mom for a while. And, you know, honestly, if I was coming out of the shower and my girlfriend was there, I wouldn't be in any hurry to put on clothes. And I remember when I was a little kid, he would occasionally, like, walk out of the shower still toweling off. And it was no big deal to see my dad's dick dangling around almost to his knee, <laughs> almost as big as mine. I was 18. Um, it was normal. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> But then, like, as we got older, it's like, yeah, you just don't – there's some things you just don't do. And I personally am an extremely private person. If I had a kid, I would definitely be covering up. So I don't know. I, did either of you guys have the kind of open household where you have birthday parties in the bathtub? <laughs> <laughs> possibly. Po- did you Did you guys ever possibly bathe with your parents as adults? 
<clears throat> no. I think my 2020 birthday was in the uh, in the bathtub because <laughs> we can't go anywhere. <laughs> Who wrote and directed this movie? Uh, the this is Richard Donner directed, and it's written by Shane Black. I, you know, we, some of this stuff, I feel like we need to maybe open up a Me Too file on those two. <laughs> <laughs> because some of this stuff, first of all, the very opening scene, like we get off a plane, a beautiful L.A. nice guy, first thing we see is a titty out. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't upset. I was having a, a waffle that I had just made. I was like, let me sit down and eat this waffle, watch this film for the podcast tonight. And I was like, oh, okay, first scene. For, right out the gate, first image is a titty. And then we get to the bathtub scene. And I'm like, y'all could he could have been getting out of the tub. Like, like if, if I was rewriting the movie to show how old he's getting, I would have had him getting out of the tub and struggling to get out of the tub <laughs> to show like, oh boy, like ah, my, back. my back, I'm getting too over this shit. I need those Number handles. One. I need the bathtub handles for old people. Yeah. I, like that. They already do the full rear nudity with Gibson also anyways. Yes. They could have done, the they could have had a nice, a nice uh, pairing of those, you know, cause the characters are yeah. sort of playing yeah. off each other. They could have done like, we could have seen both their asses. Yeah. <laughs> and then like you see Danny Glover's ass. They were afraid that Danny Glover's ass would be too tight to pass for a 50-year-old. They were like, his That's face what it was. will put a mustache on him. But if anybody saw that ass, <laughs> that tight, yeah. tight booty, this, that they'd be like, they no way, done a, a 50. <laughs> they should have done a gray butt crack wig. <laughs> he is not too old for this shit. A gray butt crack yeah. murky. No, no. <laughs> yeah. He is plenty young for this shit. <laughs> yeah, that that was, I didn't understand. I was like, why are they all in there? Like, I, it, listen. Like if you live on a commune or something, if you, if listener, if you were raised in a situation where your family was comfortable with nudity, I do not judge as long as there was no foul play around. But to me, a person who was who still puts his underwear on in the bathroom, and I live by myself, <laughs> <laughs> and I still put my underwear on in the bathroom. Yeah. Like I still bring a pair of boxes into the bathroom to put them on for when I get out. I don't even close the door, and yet before I cross that threshold i still gotta put my <laughs> gotta underwear be dressed yeah just in case somebody's like peeking through a uh, part of my blinds or something i don't know it's weird it's a weird it's a weird scene and it but in a way it does sort of set up this idea that like murtaugh's family is so copacetic and so like happy and cool with everything that it's like the safe happy family life where nothing could go wrong and you're even safe in the bathtub because people they'll they'll go into the bathroom but they're not going to fuck with you and like talk about your your dingling or anything like that. They're just going <laughs> to act like it's they're going to like overlook the entire thing. It's going to be like cool, you know. Whereas I preferred Murtaugh when is, you used that other word. What was it? Schwanz. Schwanz. What is, Schwanz? Schwanz? <laughs> yeah, Schwanz, yes. what is that? I've never it's, heard that. <laughs> so, I don't know. Schwanz? I assume it's Yiddish. I think it's uh, okay. It's, <laughs> it's Yiddish for hog. I'm just I'm making that up, but. It could be, <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, I think that's that that is like something that this movie does well, is it, it establishes the juxtaposition of Murtaugh's safe family life with Riggs being a complete dumpster fire, and then you you define these characters right away. The opening scenes just sort of spells out that Murtaugh's doing good and Riggs is a mess, but at the same time, they have the same problem where Murtaugh's aging and wondering how much he's got left in him. And Riggs is depressed and wondering how much life he's got left in him. So they're both like they're both like perpendicular and on parallel career tracks as cops, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean this movie brings me back or it makes me like miss a certain kind of movie. I and I you know, it's the eighties was full of stuff like this, but like you know, it, like the writing is so good, the dialogue feels natural for people, like this is how people talk. I feel like if this movie were made today, it would not be R-rated, um, you know. And, I don't know. And then, like, just like the unnecessary nudity all over the place. I, I miss, I miss that in movies. Yeah. I miss um, gratuitous nudity. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I do think they were trying to show, like, because we talked about this in the text thread. Because um, I think Matt said like the unnecessary nudity on the the suicide girl, and it's like. Well, they did. They didn't just show her commit suicide. They did show her doing a lot of wallowing, wallowing around, being drugged up. You know, mm -hmm. there there was there was an effort there to to tie the nudity to you know drugs, I guess. Um, so I, I appreciate well, she, that. She put a little <laughs> coke on her nipple and snorted. Yeah, 
Yeah. You, you, didn't, my, see, uh, you yeah. didn't see that part? <laughs> my argument. Yeah, that? That, that guy cut. That's one of the deleted <laughs> scenes. Is her snow, yeah. her own nipple. <laughs> my argument was that that nudity seemed very essential to me to the entire tone of the movie. Like it's yep. just mm-hmm. like like uh, Carl said, it's like establishing right away what you're do- what we're doing here. We're gonna have there boobs. will be nudity in this. Yeah, we're movie. gonna have boobs <laughs> and and gunfights and explosions. And this is the kind of movie this is. We're gonna have some homophobia. We're gonna have some other you know like non uh, you know. And honestly, that's the part that hasn't. You know, we should talk about Shane Black a little bit um, because I know uh, you probably mentioned him in your intro, Matt. Um, but uh, he—he w- this was his big breakout. You know, he was. L- this is literally the second screenplay he ever wrote, um, and he. This was a, a year out of UCLA. He wrote this screenplay, shopped it around, and sold it for a cool quarter million dollars. Um, and went on to become one of the hottest screenwriters in Hollywood, mostly because of this. Um, but it is, in a way, when you look at his later scripts, you see how he matured. He still has this sort of meta, you know, um, ironic bent that I think is very 90s, 2000s, and has and isn't aging as well. But at the same time, um, it, this is a very, like, macho, you know, tough guy script, um, that isn't this kind of unapologetic about it, which at this time was exactly what people were looking for. Uh, but mm-hmm. you know, I just kept on thinking like, I don't think a lot of it, it this the series got more clever as it progressed. You know? Yeah, I was actually watching this, and uh, Colleen, uh, my wife Colleen, came in the room, and I was like, "Oh, you should watch this with me." And she's like, uh, "Who's the girl in this?" And I was like. There is no girl. <laughs> <laughs> nope, this is a, a Bechdel test flop. <laughs> yeah. This is a you know I I'm not the listen I don't I don't claim to be the woke police, but a couple things in this movie I was like ah oh, come on yeah like yeah, love absolutely. hanging like I'm not I'm not I'm not at all a person who's like I need this this question needs to be answered these quotas need to be filled. And this there was bothered t- me, and this offended yeah. me, and, and yeah. I'm going to take it personally, yeah. <laughs> I'm not that guy, but I did, like, I, like it felt like when Murtaugh made the made the dig at the prostitute, I was like, he ain't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, like, first of all, sex worker, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like... What do you say? Yeah. All dressed up and nowhere to blow? Yeah. No to blow. No, oh, yeah. All dressed up and no one to blow. It's like, you're supposed to be the family man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like uh, she's just doing her job, man. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get, cut her some slack. <laughs> yeah. And then we had like a couple of uh, you know homophobic scenes when they're at the gun range. One that I never caught before because I know the one where they the one where uh, Riggs's jacket's on fire and Murtaugh's trying to yeah. put the fire out and he's like, "What are you a fag I'm or something?" That right now, um, <laughs> I didn't and, notice uh, that until I had the subtitles on because uh, yeah. I couldn't hear him. You know? Yeah. So he says, "What are you a fag or something?" And it's like that's been for years. I've I've seen that and been like, "Ooh, that hasn't aged well." Yikes. Um, but there's also a moment where they're at their firing range and they're talking about like maybe Dixie was the other person in bed with Amanda Huntsucker, and and at some point Mel Gibson's like, "Yeah, maybe it's He's two like, women gross, in bed together." Right? I mean, yeah, sure, it's disgusting, but you know, maybe that's. And I was like, "Ooh, yeah, yikes!" Right, yeah. Just judging people. All right, fine, okay, I, I guess. You know, this <laughs> sort of fits into later Mel Gibson, <laughs> you know, like far yeah. right winger <laughs> ideologies. But okay, he says something about the uh, the guy who tortures him at the end too, who was played by I think his name's Al Leung. the guy who's yeah. oh, in yeah. like every action movie. He's in Die Hard. Oh, he calls him the um, c-word right off the bat. Doesn't oh, he? does he? Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. That's that's Endo. Endo has Endo, forgotten yeah. more about dispensing pain than you and I will ever know. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Endo line. is also in Die Hard, obviously, Big Trouble in Little China, and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, where he plays Genghis Khan. Um, but really, seriously, oh, he's also one of the uh, triad guys on. Um, in Lethal Weapon 4, just blending into the background, so he's resurrected somehow. <laughs> he's back <laughs> yeah. with a vengeance. Uh, yeah. This, uh, I have a question about this. Um, do you guys say Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan? Because when people say Genghis Khan, it makes me uncomfortable, and I prefer Genghis. I've never it's heard of It's one of those things where you we all say it incorrectly, but 
we've accepted yeah. that as I mean, a society. It's not like yeah. we're speaking like old Mongolian. I'm, I've always said Genghis Khan. I think it's funny when yeah. people insist on on saying something a way that nobody else says it because it's like the the original correct pronunciation when like the entire point of language is like basically zero words that we say now were are pronounced the way they were pronounced when they were invented except for the ones that were just invented recently because they all change pronunciation even in like a hundred years or so or do you ever meet anybody who like they are not like a, 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 of latin descent but for some reason when they say certain <laughs> Like Spanish words, they pronounce them that way. Yeah. You know, like, I do that. Are you talking about me? You do. <laughs> do you do that? Yeah, man. When I like, when oh I, man, the summer of uh, 2010. Yeah, me and my friends, we went on a cruise down to Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it that bad, but sometimes there's some stuff like, oh, um, like you guys know, I like uh, chilaquiles, and like that's just hard to say for some white people. And I'm like all about that. And, I think uh, chilaquiles yeah. is fun. Is is fine. It don't make it when people say that word because it's got some words you gotta like. If somebody was like nachos, then it's like yeah. okay, you're <laughs> yeah, being that's... ridiculous. It's not yeah. nice. No. But I do that when I'm by myself, though, for sure. <laughs> the Taco Bell drive-through by yourself, like yes, I'll have the gorditas crunch. <laughs> yeah. When you do that. Uh, I always feel like, I always feel weird when I go to taco trucks and I ask for sour cream and they are like what and I'm like uh, crema and they're yeah. like he wants sour cream on it and I'm yeah. like I said sour cream the first time oh my god the taco trucks when you, if if you order in English and then they ask you and then you say it in Spanish they always say it back in English you know what I mean like oh I knew what you were talking about the whole time I'm just fucking with you we just wanted to hear you yeah. say it I, like, I want sour you cream Spanish. you want what Crema. Oh, he wants sour cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this idiot thinks he could talk Spanish all of a sudden. It was hilarious. I got it all on tape. We're going to listen to it later. <laughs> Laugh about it. I'm going to start speaking in a Spanish accent for made up Spanish words like, yo, pass me that bag of fritos. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Doritos. 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 That's uh, you were saying. Uh, except the new words, you think in like 150 years, the pretentious people are going to be like, "I have to take a selfie." <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Self. No. What What will actually happen is everyone else will be pronouncing it selfie, and they'll be like, "Well, actually, you know, it's pronounced selfie." <laughs> yeah. Because some. Does it make you uncomfortable when people say selfie? <laughs> this is the Colin of 150 years. This is the GIF years, argument. Man. Everyone's always like, "Well, you know, the guy who invented them calls them GIFs," and it's like it doesn't fucking matter. Everyone else is calling them GIFs. <laughs> Just yeah. get with the yeah. program, assholes. Yeah. Moms like you choose GIF. I <laughs> yeah. choose GIF. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. GIF is the peanut butter. Um, GIF is the, th the yeah. weird internet thing that we laugh at. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think, like, I'm the type of person, like, every once in a while there's words, weird stuff, like, where I will just pronounce it a weird way on purpose because I just want to be different. Like, have you guys ever had a friend named Craig? No. Oh, do you say Craig? Uh, Craig. <laughs> What's <Craig>? up, Craig? <laughs> yeah, I can't. I don't. I don't want to say. I don't want to say Craig. I want to say Craig every time. Craig. Craig. But I'm from the south, so when I say Greg and Craig, I would say it's it's like when I say egg, I don't say eggs. I say oh, I, eggs. I do that. <laughs> just like I really just pronounce that e h Craig. So I would say Craig. Yeah. Well, I constantly mispronounce things that I don't even – like, even my own family doesn't pronounce things the way I do, and people make fun of me for saying, like, water and, and you know. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, my, yeah, fr my friend David listened funny. to the, the Rudy podcast, and he's like, there's basically nothing more annoying than hearing uh, Harris say the word quarterback. <laughs> 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 Every time he's like, the quarterback. <laughs> you know, some people find it endearing. <laughs> so, I, wait, your I, family I, doesn't say – quarter like that i don't think so they make fun of me too <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> where did you get that from i don't know you're just a weird kid you're like i'm just gonna say this this way i don't think i, I love think how far be, i think it is like a massachusetts thing or a new england th i picked it up from somewhere my dad might say it my dad says like warsh and idea and stuff like that <clears throat> do you say jimmies instead of sprinkles too huh what jimmies like the no, things you put on no, your ice cream. No, I say sprinkles, but the but the chocolate ones are ants. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Oh, wait, what is the <laughs> other word for sprinkles? Jimmies. In New England, they call them jimmies. Jimmies, oh, like Jimmy that hats. Before. That sounds like condoms to me. No, that's you say a sprinkles condom, when you put yeah. on a condom. <laughs> yeah, those are the <laughs> sprinkles. Oh my god, we just 
hold on, this is a billion dollar idea. Sprinkled condoms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. It's Sprinkles not. Sprinkles <laughs> It's not. That, it's which not. side are they on? I don't I don't feel like this is gonna be good. <laughs> Both sides? I don't know. <laughs> Jimmied for her pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. Why would you say that, Eric? <laughs> uh I love how far away we've gotten from lethal weapon at this point. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what I want to talk about? Um I wanna talk about uh, an actor named Michael Shaner. Um Michael Shaner played the suicidal guy who was jumping off a roof and he was oh, okay. acting he was acting so hard. He was acting <laughs> yeah. so like he was acting so hard like harder than anybody else has ever acted in this movie. Yeah, he was the most believable as a cocaine user of all the people who <laughs> yes. were in this movie for me. I bought his performance as like typical 80s LA douche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did not have a long career, but I bet you he spent, like, this is the sad thing about living in L.A. is it makes me look at every movie in the terms of the people who made it. Um, yeah. And that's not always, that's sometimes a depressing thing. Because Michael Shaner, at one point, was a young, fairly handsome, up-and-coming actor who <laughs> ended up starring in a pretty big role, in a, in a pretty big scene, in a huge, huge like world changing action movie and i think for like a couple of weeks his friends were like like he was dining out on this his friends were like congratulating him everywhere he went people were recognizing yeah you're the lethal weapon guy oh my god i loved you in that oh you were great blah 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 blah. people are buying him drinks and then uh it never works out for michael shaner and <laughs> this is it it's just this one time when he overacted as a suicidal jumper and it's like <laughs> I kind of the sad thing is that I know th- like I see Michael Shaner's all over LA today and I might even be one and you know like it's like this is just sort of what LA does like there's not everyone gets to make it but enough of us get to have that like glimpse of it that it's yeah. d- extra depressing to see Michael Shaner have his one yeah. shot at glory and well you don't know maybe the fame got to his head and he just like yeah peaked so hard you know he just had to come down and just leave Hollywood and yeah, you're know, like taking away a lot of his thought. agency to destroy himself, <laughs> Harris. <laughs> That's true. That's true. This could have been self-inflicted Michael Shaner self-destruction. Yeah. Maybe he what just got too do? high on himself, and he's like, don't you know who I am? I'm Michael Shaner. I've played against Mel Gibson on a Ruth scene. <laughs> when you see people like him, you got to go to their IMDb's and look at like additional miscellaneous stuff, and it's like production assistant, production assistant, production yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I've wah, definitely wah, been on set wah. where PAs are like, "Yeah, man, you know, I used to be man back in 1993. I was, you know, I was the man on this and that and this." And you're like, "Damn, man!" Like I'm being polite, like, "Hell yeah, that's dumb. I remember I was watching that. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah, I remember y'all, man. That's dope." And you know, give him a little bit of like, give him a little bit of love before you're like, "Okay, but yeah, you." Uh, and Quentin Tarantino's like, this. "You know what? I think I could cast you in something." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, nah, man, that that you pr- he probably got a residual check hanging up in in residuals bar somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Do y'all ever go in that bar and, and see those residuals? Yeah, I used checks? to go there a lot. Those residuals checks are so cool. Yeah, right. I've never I've never been there. It's I in North Hollywood. It's like on Ventura, yeah, Boulevard, yeah. And it's it's the the premise of it, not the premise of it, but the like at the bar. If you take <laughs> What's a resi- the premise of this bar, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you, serving if you take alcohol a re- in exchange yeah. for money. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, clever. If you, if you if you take a residual check lower than uh, lower than five dollars, you get a free drink. <laughs> yep. Uh, That's- that's uh, okay. pretty nice, although I imagine it took a while for his residuals to get there because I imagine for a while this was probably selling pretty well, and this was an era when residuals were, you know, a big part of what every, everyone got a little piece of that pie, and, um, you know, every time some new format came. But then there's, there is the, always there's the thing where the, you know, the 85-cent residual checks and, the, you know, the... Two dollar yeah. residual checks just keep on trickling in month to month. You can't make, you can't live off of it. But at the same time, you don't want to throw them away, which is the brilliance of that bar. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to get a, a check that's worth the minimum amount above the paper that it's printed on. <laughs> that's yeah. that, having yeah. 
friends in the service industry, I've always marveled at the checks that like literally are less than, you know, probably the ink and paper that they were printed on. Yeah. I, I got a couple one cent checks sitting over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, that would be the shred. ones. You, you should train those. those. Start yeah. a collage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you could start a project to um, like turn them into bigger checks, but that's check fraud. So I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> Just like <laughs> like catch me if you can. Yes. Like putting stickers on them in the bathroom. Yes, I'm, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I <laughs> definitely am not going to do that. That's because good. we're recording this for the world to hear. I <laughs> you blew it, Colin. Am he, not going to do that. You That's ruined criminal. It, Colin. <laughs> no, this is an alibi. I just gave him an alibi. He, he <laughs> clearly says he won't do it. We all witnessed it. <laughs> so it's got two zeros, a period, a zero, a one, another, a comma, and then several more zeros. And then another. <laughs> this check is too confusing. <laughs> A thousandth of a cent. I just watched the scene where Michael Hunsaker gets killed. Suddenly, uh, what's his name? Gary Busey appears via helicopter in the background. Yep. He mm-hmm. just like is aware somehow that he's been talking to uh, to Mert. Is it Murtaugh on that scene? Yeah, yes. he's talking to Murtaugh. And the thing I love is that there's just like random like single serve cartons of eggnog <laughs> all around. Yes. <laughs> I noticed and that he's too. Drinking from it as one as one Just, keeps in their fancy home office around Christmas time. Yeah, <laughs> I love while there's a funeral going on in the background outside. Yeah, I love that. They're like, yeah, there's a table full of them, and he gets so anxious that he has to just like pop one and like and he slam an- some I mean, back. He wasn't anxious; he was nervous, and his mouth got dry, and he was thirsty. <laughs> and no, and everyone knows nothing quenches thirst. Like warm <laughs> like eggnog, thick viscous <laughs> eggnog. <Yeah. laughs> so nasty. I love eggnog. Fuck you. I think this is all for the um. They they quote the Manchurian Candidate, the original black and white one, the John Frankenheimer one, when he gets shot and it goes through the eggnog. That's like a direct image quote from the Manchurian Candidate when the guy gets shot through a milk carton. Um. So I think they actually they might have. Richard Donner it was trying to be a real director and not an action movie schlock hound like he is, um, and was like, I know what I'll do. I'll reference a famous movie that everyone respects with a shot. <laughs> so, uh, whoever they got for helicopter pilot on that team, like, was way better. That he was better than Mr. Joshua. I realize Mr. Joshua got several kills, but that helicopter pilot was doing all the work. Oh. Also, when they at the helicopter scene when they land at the end, he like comes in and does like a sick like skid landing. Oh yeah, it was, yeah. It was pretty pretty dope. And when he's chasing the daughter, he's like yeah. tapping the roof he, of her. He car. fucks up a limo yeah, with yeah. a helicopter. I was like, God, I feel like a, the limo should win this fight. It can't cr- it can't crash into the ground. It's already there. How do you how do you have those kind of helicopter stunts and not have the helicopter pilot be a named character? That's what I'm saying. How do you have those kind of helicopter stunts on a fifteen million dollar budget? This movie's like <laughs> kind of insanely cheap for for what it was. <laughs> maybe maybe they just found someone and they just happened to be that talented at helicopter flying. They were like, right. we, we just got someone to fly this helicopter. Like the and, trick is uh, they've that never that actually flown, never flown a helicopter before. before. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. How you drive this thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I and think I got it. it. It's just like a it car except no wheels. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Just doing loop de loops and shit. Like, is that good? We can we use that? <laughs> so yeah, I think I figured uh, out how to drift. Should, should I do that in the next scene? <laughs> Are you familiar with the concepts of lift and thrust? Nah, fuck that. <laughs> no, no, frontwards and backwards. That's mostly what I do. <laughs> Um. Yeah. I mean, we're we're starting to talk about the bad guys. Do we want to talk about the bad guys in this movie? What did you guys think of the uh, the general as the main? He I know him from Liar Liar. He's, yeah. He's the boss from Liar Liar. I didn't know he's him from a, that. He's a he... silly man to me. What <laughs> I knew him he's from a silly guy. What I knew him from, which doesn't really help the silliness, was he's the, he's Mini Driver's dad in Gross Point Blank. I was gonna say that. I looked mm. that up. Yeah. I love Gross Point Blank. Yeah. That's a good one. Carl, no. have you seen Gross Point Blank? Should I watch it? Oh. Is it funny? It's yeah, it's like a weird comedy because he's a hitman and he's going to his oh, uh, high school reunion. So it's like I guess what like dark comedy. That's a pretty of. good premise. That's like a pretty good premise because you could say that it's a hitman going back to his high school reunion and everyone's like, oh, 
Yeah, if that's huh. good, I'll watch it. Yeah, it's a, uh, and that's, that's exactly what it is. All your movies, all your movies should be that where you're where if you say in one sentence, it's this and this happens, everyone goes, oh, if that's good, I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's nice because we all wish we were assassins going to our high school reunion so we could take out some. <laughs> some I was cool in high school, so I wouldn't want to kill nobody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. Well, you better I got watch along out with everybody. <laughs> Um, I I like Minnie Driver also. I even though she has her like a really large head, I think she's charming. I don't think she has a large. <laughs> she is she is quite charming. I don't think she has a larger than normal head. I just think she's got a really flat face. It's like very um. <laughs> okay, well, let's. Are we gonna debate that? I don't. I don't really want to debate I, that. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't have to debate that. I all, I agree that she's charming and a fine actress. I just think it's like more. Should the we watch Goodwill movies. Hunting right now and end this debate? Oh. <laughs> oh, Family Guy. They say she's got a big head. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's well, well, yeah. Was she the love interest in Goodwill well, Hunting? Guy, I guess. Yeah. She's the love interest in Goodwill okay. Hunting. Yeah, yeah, she's definitely the love interest in Goodwill Hunting. Uh, I didn't like the the bad guys in this. Yeah. No, they're forgettable, right? right. Yeah, I like Gary Vee. I was like, just see, okay. So I think we've reached the point where I have to tell you what my biggest gripe about this movie was. Ooh, I want to hear it. Why the hell are these cops so morally competent that they just can't kill nobody? Take them alive. Everybody's got to go alive. Even when they're getting... But they absolutely don't do that at when all. When they're getting machine gun <laughs> shot at them. When they go to the dude's house and they shoot at the guy, and the guy starts shooting at them, and they pop two in him and he falls in the in the pool and they try to save him. It's like, why are you trying to save this dude? He was trying to kill you. Like, yeah. cops have shot people for doesn't... much less than what these dudes were doing <laughs> in this movie. And then at the end where it was a whole put your dukes up thing, man, if you don't shoot that dude in the head... <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. That that final fight is what is like the worst part of the movie where they they're having a fist fight on the lawn. It's like I I get what they were saying about the characters is like, yeah, this is this is where we've gotten to in their journey, but like at the end of that scene, it should be like everyone here is fucking fired. We're getting a whole new police force. <laughs> this is the stupidest shit you could ever do with fucking police authority. Are you fucking kidding me? You're fucking fired. Get the hell out of this. I city. needed more. Like- I needed more from like I needed because for me it was just like, oh, this is the only bad guy you want to have a fist fight with. Like I need more. I need more like. Mm-hmm context as to why this dude nah i'm just gonna beat your ass was it was it because of the electro shock because i would do that to him take him in the basement i know y'all got some loose wires your house is under construction go give him some of that action don't just be like nah put mm-hmm. your dukes up pal like no yeah if if anything it should have been murtaugh who who fought him because he kidnapped yes, his yes, daughter yes. you know i agree also and, shouldn't and also all the cops have just been like this should be just like a, a gang beating where they just all jump in and stomp him because he just shot two cops. Which, by the way, yes, my my whole thi- my biggest problem with the ending is the ending of this movie is so fucking stupid. Um, where they actually realize, oh, Mr. Joshua might come after Murtaugh's family. They somehow get to the family in time to get them out of the house. Leave a funny note for him. But they don't tell the two cops that are sitting outside, hey, if you see a blonde guy, shoot him on sight. Don't fuck around. So two cops die because they're not adequately prepared for Mr. Joshua to show up. Then the only way they can adequately distract Mr. Joshua to take him is to drive a car through the front of the house. And that's how they take him. And then they and then they somehow still manage to let him get a weapon at the end and almost kill them again after all of this. It doesn't make it's any shockingly, sense. It's shockingly incompetent. It was a good plan, man. And also, they're all like cheering this fist fight at the end. Did anybody call an ambulance for the two cops who got shot? They might still be alive. <laughs> like nobody even addresses these two cops in the cruiser that are outside. And they they have to have like over the radio some other cop saying like Murtaugh has the authority here because he's out there saying like no 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 it's one fine. shoot anyone this fist fight has to happen. <laughs> like, which why? Yeah yeah. Also, and all the other cops are just like all right. <laughs> Also, I remember this as one of the great movie fight scenes. And everyone talks about how much training they did and all these martial arts. They did, um, you know, capoeira training. They did, like, uh, uh, 52 blocks capoeira? or whatever, uh, or jailhouse rock or whatever it is. 
um, capoeira. Capoeira. Yeah, <laughs> capoeira. Capoeira could change. Walker. Uh, uh, um, and they did like all this taekwondo and shit. And these two guys trained and it was like, oh, they trained two hours a day for three months to do this fight scene. And then you look at the fight scene and it's, first of all, it's shot and edited so choppily that you can't even tell what's going on half the time. And when you can, they both look like super slow and unathletic. Yeah. And I was just amazed at how, in my childhood, this was like a badass fight scene that totally worked. And I was watching it, and I was like, oh, my God. this!" I don't think the fire hydrant is necessary either. Well, it could be cool. It's it's like a good like it's like a good look to the scene. It adds some personality to rather than just two guys fighting in a suburban front yard. Wait, that's the other detail you forgot is that so their plan was to drive the car through the house, but they also knocked over a fire hydrant in doing so. Like if they were going to set up the car to go in the house, wouldn't they? No, the not the, the hit dead the fire cops hydrant? knocked over the fire yeah. hydrant. Technically, yeah. oh, they did. Yes. Yeah, the, the cops <laughs> that got killed. Who should those what cops happened? should have been told if you see someone, be ready to shoot them. They they should have been told, like like most cops, I think, are, if you see anybody that's even slightly suspicious, just start shooting, figure it out later. It's That's the rule here. So the, um, but they, they didn't. I These just were realized, the nice cops. I just realized that that was, the, that was the water that was pouring from the sky. It wasn't raining all of a sudden. It was the Yeah, it, it was wasn't raining. <laughs> right, yeah, fire hydrant water. I just realized that. Because I was so confused. Yeah. I'm like, why are they fighting? I couldn't, like... <laughs> I couldn't I thought that yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> also the ending of the uh the the henchman the second in command surviving somehow and then as he's being taken into custody suddenly grabbing a cop's gun in slow motion and then getting shot is the Damn. exact ending of Die Hard which came out the next year. <laughs> now technically yeah. Die Hard did it did it better because it had a nice payoff, but I I just think it's funny that like these movies were so unashamed about being like yeah, this is just how we end movies now. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're all they all to end with the the henchman somehow coming back when you thought he was dead and grabbing a gun and getting shot. Honestly, in slow motion. I see, like super slow motion. At that point, I was like, kill them, kill all the cops, Gary Busey, because <laughs> yeah. these dudes are stupid as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. If you are still alive, You're doing the world a service, they are not so good. At they're their not job. good at the shit. Yeah. Kill them. I. S- I see here in your script you did not write a final scene. Yeah, we're gonna do the you know the slow mo gun shoot him thing. We always do that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. Got, it, got it. That's actually oh, yeah, how okay. it's written. It's very you know it's like typical sh- sparse Shane Black style and slow mo gun bad guy scene end <laughs> end end. I'm too old for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, should we talk about yeah. some like like things ridiculous things in this movie other than the ending like mel gibson's accent that is that is just good enough (laughs) like he was born in america he is an american technically um but his accent is like passable for so much of this movie and then occasionally he says things like like i haven't killed you yet (laughs) it's like oh um (laughs) not uh not totally spot on you know, um, or do you th- or Roger, this is a special forces tattoo. <laughs> that one, that's the line that got me the most. The special forces, because no one, no one, in, uh, no American person says special forces the way he says special forces in right, this movie. Yeah. He drops his R's. <laughs> special forces. Yeah. What got it for me was when he was when he was on the roof with the dude. He was like, "You want a cigarette? They're magically delicious." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he's not from America. <laughs> um, when he was uh, when he was being tortured, when he's hanging up like this, you know, uh, he was reminding me of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was making his grunts. He was like, <laughs> 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 you know, the uh, the Irish leprechaun is rare, but there is nothing more rare than the Australian leprechaun. That's the uh, that's <laughs> the one that's hard to find. <laughs> it says Irish on his on his uh, on his. Wikipedia. Does it? Oh yeah. Well, I think he's like. I think his dad was probably Irish. I think his dad, his dad, who is a famous um, uh, Holocaust denier 
and collector of oh. Nazi memorabilia, which which oh, for no. years this was like the Mel Gibson story was like his dad is such a is such a deranged you know asshole who you know is a closet Nazi and somehow Mel Gibson turned out okay <laughs> and he spent all this time like denying it and being like yeah I, I can't uh, none of my dad's beliefs you know trickle down to me and blah 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 and that's that's the other <laughs> thing about Mel Gibson is like you know clearly some of this you know permeated his consciousness and but it but for so long we were like oh man it's amazing that he's such a nice guy despite being raised by a father who has all these you know horrible beliefs and um and yeah Damn. well have you guys ever seen the movie he did uh what women want where yeah. like women i saw women it a read. long time ago I it's actually it. very charming helen hunt <laughs> <laughs> helen hunt um Helen Hunt, you don't have to look hard for how good she is. You don't have to hunt for that. Damn it. I fucked wow. up. That was not a good one. Yeah. yeah no, Carl, really you funny. didn't hear that, Carl. Turn Carl, off the you lights didn't hear that. and slowly close your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some... Don't, <laughs> tell, don't make a sound. No! You don't want to know wait, where you wait, are in the What was Colin's room? previous worst pun ever? I, I think it was one of the Star Trek ones. Um, but yeah. I forget them immediately. Yeah. I would never be able to recall. Yeah. No, that was, that was bad because it, it didn't even come off. I can tell you the best one he ever did. It was that Brian De Palma one. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. the one. Yeah. yeah. In De Palma's hand. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Classic. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, another another thing that – so there's a lot of stuff that just bothers me about this movie on, like, a technical logistics perspective. Like, I love the gun range scene, but have you guys ever gone to a gun range and fired a handgun at targets? Like – no. Once it gets no. more than twenty feet away, you're hoping you hit the piece of paper that it's on, and and I'm not. And obviously, if you practice more, you would get better. But when he shoots it like you know fifty down, fifty yards down the range, and draws a smiley face in the face, it's like that's getting into the thing where like you might be a superhero if you're doing shit like that. Like I don't know. Well, that's the idea. Yeah, I think. yeah. I he's guess like, I guess that's what they're that saying. Good. But it is sort of if you've ever it's the only thing I'm good at. If you've ever fired a handgun and sort of know what that's like. It's that kind of isn't something that you it's could impossible. imagine happening. Yeah, it's very difficult. Well, his wrists are really strong. Maybe you know he spends a lot of time in that trailer with that picture of his dead wife. And oh, gross! His, maybe his wrists are really. That's does disgusting. he alternate? Does he alternate hands though? <laughs> I don't know. That's gross. Um, one thing I thought was really weird was when they cut to that shot of like it's in the very beginning when they go to the police station for the first time, and it's like. An elderly policewoman, like conducting a bunch of other cops, yeah. like singing Christmas songs. What the fuck was oh, that? All? What the like, hell was that? And they they just held on that for so long, and then just moved on. I was like, what the it's fuck? Like, this is important. Oh wait, no, never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah I it's feel not like, even like the, a funny segue. I feel like the front half of the movie had a bunch of scenes that were drawn out to give us like an atmosphere and a mood, yeah. and you know, the second half just had so much action. It like. It kind of was like a juxtaposition almost, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Also, when he's with the whole thing with the special forces tattoo, the lick and stick tattoo on his uh, forearm or whatever it is, I um, yeah. only because my dad was in the special forces, my dad wasn't allowed to get a tattoo because you're supposed to be like part diplomat, part spy, part, you know, like it's not necessarily, it's not a, um, what do you call it? Uh, I think they. I think the term is direct action, where like SEAL Team Six or something is like they send them in to fuck shit up. The special forces usually yeah. get sent in for more like tactful missions, where they're there to like train people or subvert an authority without anybody knowing they're in the country yeah. or something. You so don't. You don't of... necessarily want identifying markers. Exactly, right? which is yeah. why like you couldn't like I couldn't even have been in the special forces because I'm too tall. I would stand out. Where my dad was like six feet, you know, brown hair white guy and he was yeah and i mean part of this his, their thing was he had to learn enough danish he didn't have to be fluent in danish but he had to be fluent uh, he had to, his accent had to be good enough that people would think that he was actually danish so if somebody was describing him they'd be like yeah he was like a six foot tall brown haired white guy who i think was from denmark um and so like the idea of a tattoo at least at this point in time they weren't supposed to get them um yeah so it's kind you of wouldn't like want to have a, a, any you wouldn't want to have any den markings you know <laughs> that's not that's not terrible every 
Everybody, sh- close your laptop. <laughs> Not the lights. Should I close my laptop just because I uh, laughed at it? I feel I feel guilty for encouraging it. <laughs> Hang out these. <laughs> wrap these wire hangers around your fist. <laughs> oh my god! So brutal. <laughs> you were in comedy jail, Colin. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, this movie's crazy. Uh, was this movie? I mean, obviously it was a hit. Was it a critical hit too? Um, not really. It got, I would say, mixed reviews from what I've seen. Um, however, it got one important review, which was Roger Ebert gave it four stars and a glowing review that was like, this is how action movies should be done. This is an adrenaline rush from start to finish. And, you know, basically his review, like, cause this was not promoted at all. Um, it, because they knew that they had in, you know, first time writer, they had Richard Donner, who was kind of, you know, he had had a big hit with Superman, but he wasn't like necessarily like nobody's going to see a Richard Donner movie because of Richard Donner. Um, Joel Silver, the producer was a legendary action producer, but they, was he like already at his, like, uh, this was like probably middle, middle of his career, early, early to middle of his career. But he, you know, everyone knew that he'd do good stuff, but they didn't know that anything would happen. And obviously Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, American audiences didn't know them at all, you know? So they were not depend. Danny Glover was a theater guy, and Mel Gibson, like I said, Mad Max wasn't oh. widely known, and he only got this part because he was in a couple of random Peter Weir movies that people liked that sort of showed off some of his charisma. Um, so nobody expected this to be big. It opened in March, which is not a big month, and basically it benefited from like nothing else coming out th- at the time it did. Like No other good movies came out for a few weeks. Um, I think the Bruce Willis movie Blind Date is actually what knocked it out of the top box office spot with uh, Kim Basinger. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that tells you something. Nobody even remembers that movie. Um, yeah. But yeah, between that and the, the Roger Ebert review got a lot of people to notice it. And then word of mouth actually spread it out. So this is like, this made like a hundred, I think 120 million on a, uh, yeah, 120 million on a $15 million budget. So it was a huge hit. Um, wow. And for, for those younger listeners out there, you might not know that in the eighties, the word of, Roger Ebert was law. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's said, the only way that people knew uh, like what movies were. You said he gave it four stars, so this is before the thumbs even? This is like... <laughs> <laughs> he, he gave it four thumbs, and two stars, yeah. and eight strawberries. Yeah. It was a very complicated system that only he understood. It's before he grew thumbs. You know, yeah. some, some people say he didn't get the thumbs until movies were good enough. <laughs> He just no, said he fingers had, he, before that. He gave stars in his <laughs> columns. He gave stars in his columns. He gave thumbs right. on the show. And um, and Siskel, I think, gave it a thumbs down. So that was like, the critics were very split that on this movie. son of a bitch. No, and it got, it, <laughs> yeah, Siskel, it got, you it got pe- pretty fiercely panned. But because he, ha- he was such a high-profile critic, he was like one of uh, just maybe one or two or three most influential critics in the country. So when he raved about something, people noticed. If I was producing the Siskel and Ebert show back then and – uh, Ebert gave it thumbs up and Siskel gave it thumbs down. I would have them fighting on a front lawn with a fire extinguisher spraying water all over them for the finale of that um, movie review show. I thought that was going to be a pun, and I'm so glad. Thank no. you for not <laughs> <No. laughs> taking us down Pun Street again. Everybody nope. open your laptop. <laughs> We're okay. It's fine. We're it's fine. We don't have to try to kill him. <laughs> I, I just read about that movie that you just mentioned with Kim Basinger. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1987 film Blind Date. Yes. And which was also a, a romantic comedy, just like Lethal Weapon. <laughs> and I'm just kidding. Um, it says here in the plot, and I have to bring this up because we were talking about movies doing the same thing that other movies do. And it says here, Walter ends up being driven insane by Nadia's mishaps and David's pursuit. She gets him fired at the dinner. His car is destroyed. After wreaking havoc at a party, Walter gets arrested for menacing David with a mugger's revolver. He even forces David to do a moonwalk before firing at the frightened man's feet. (laughs) That is from Back to the Future 3. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yep, just Which came out after. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So Back to the Future 3 just ripping off Blind Date, (laughs) the the Bruce Willis... (laughs) Legendary Bruce Willis vehicle. Uh, I g- I think good for them. <laughs> I mean, guys, should we watch Blind Date on the Patreon? I mean, there I'm are no, let's let's just be honest. There are no new stories. Everyone knows this. Everyone's just retelling the same old shit. So you know, why shouldn't 
Back to the Future 3 Recycle Blind Date. In fact, I'm writing that whole scene into my next screenplay because it's worked twice. And um, mm-hmm. the moonwalk is still relevant. Yes, mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, some more things that bothered me about this movie. Um, there, it, that grenade, when he pulls out the grenade, when he goes to meet Mr. Joshua and the bad guys in the desert to get his daughter back and Murtaugh pulls, pulls out a grenade. I don't, it still only would have killed like two people. Right? Yeah, like, exactly. Grenades are not like, that big. Yeah. Grenade and grenades like launch shrapnel, but the farther away you are, the less like, I'm sure many people would have been hurt, but like yeah. when he says we're all going to die, it's like, no, this isn't like, a, mm. this isn't like, you know, a, a bunch of C4, <laughs> you know, like it's not yeah. going to like a, obliterate everyone. It's just a fucking grenade. Um, which makes me wonder how much like Shane Black and the makers of this movie actually knew about the weapons they were so enthusiastic, the lethal weapons they were so enthusiastic about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always felt like in movies that the power of grenades was always very inconsistent. Oh, yeah. Sometimes a grenade could like destroy a house, you know, and then sometimes if you're like five feet away from it, you're OK as long as you protect yourself. Yeah. Did you ever see the Punisher so- with uh, what, like Thomas Jane or whatever? He just like gets in a bathtub and he's fine. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, most grenades are just. I think most grenades are just shrapnel grenades, and I don't think there are grenades with enough. Because I don't think you could. I mean, the whole idea of a grenade is the thing that's holding all the explosives inside, doubles as the projectiles that, you know, hurt people when it explodes. Yeah. Like the casing is actually the violent projectiles. There's. I don't think you can have enough explosives in the grenade to create like an explosion that's big enough to blow up a house or something like that. Like there's not enough material in that tiny space. So I don't know. Um, Mm. Anyways, maybe grenade technology has come further than, than the extent of your knowledge. It's entirely possible. Also (laughs) there is in the torture scene, which I thought was really good. I like the torture scenes. I like the juxtaposing the two torture scenes. I think that's a good moment. Where does Mr. Joshua go? Does he have like a side gig tending bar at the club or something? Like, no, it's like, clear that he went to go take a shit at that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, very I, clear. I actually, I accept that answer. That's very positive. Because I was like, what excuse could this dude have? He should either be in there with his boss torturing Murtaugh, or he should be watching the Riggs torture. There is no place else for him to, because he doesn't leave the club. He's still there yeah, he when all the shit yeah. goes down. So like, and we, where does we he go? we see them go through the club, too. We see yeah, them go exactly. through the nightclub, and he's not in there. So clearly, he, he must have gone to take a dump. That... Is that is it? Uh, question answered. Thank you, Colin. Mm-hmm. My God, yeah. you're welcome. I, and everybody poops. Yeah, I gotta be honest, y'all. I hate a old villain. <laughs> Kill that man. <laughs> yeah, Beat yeah. his old ass up. Yeah, yeah. I hate yeah, a old a villain. Big opportunity here to have a cool villain. Oh, that's what's uh, that's what's great about um, what is it? Uh, the uh, 1989 Batman is uh, it starts out, you've got the old villain, and Jack Nicholson kills him and becomes the Joker. <laughs> yeah. He's like, we yeah, can't have an old up. villain in this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get out of here, Jack yeah. Plants. That's Take a good over. That's a good device, I think. Like, start you off with an old villain, and then have the real villain kill the old villain, because you kind of yeah. want the old villain See, to get cause killed it, anyway. Because if Mr. Joshua had double-crossed, uh, what's his name, the general, and taken mm-hmm. over, I would have been like, oh, yeah, now we're, now we're talking. Mr. Joshua was crazy. That would have been a good anything. scene. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Joshua and Endo. I don't know how they're going to stop him. This is it. Yeah, <laughs> if they only had, Unless if they, they could only like recruit Randall lighters. Bush onto their side. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he never showed back up. Yeah, no, he yeah, never he did. He should have come back. Yep. They and and the the other guy that was in that scene with Grandel Bush, the white guy, um, they did get him back. He like takes the phone call where he's like, "Oh yes, Riggs mm-hmm. was killed." They should have had Grandel Bush for that fucking scene. Fuck that shit. So can yep. we call somebody? They got that other guy who gave the speech about like sensitive '80s men. Yeah, yeah. what the fuck was like, that all about? Yeah. It's like I cried sounds, myself to sleep last night. Sounds like an '80s man to me. <laughs> <laughs> I really like, I really like that dialogue, but I don't understand it. <laughs> like, no. I'm just like, yeah, I agree. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm a modern '80s man myself. <laughs> I think they put that scene in there because it immediately follows the scene when Mel Gibson is crying, and I think they had to put that to like make it more macho like yep. to explain him crying like he's not a bitch he's just a sensitive <laughs> he's guy he's in tough. touch with his sensitive <laughs> side yeah exactly yeah i'm so thankful we're talking about this because it now gives me realize i didn't like this movie <laughs> <laughs> like i respect it for what it is i love a good uh danny glover performance but too many things happen in this movie where i'm like man i think i'm 
And here's what takes the cake for me. <laughs> this dude's running down Hollywood Boulevard chasing Mr. Joshua. And he makes a right on Los Palmas. And uh, <laughs> then he says Third Street? That's not third, close. He said, take the Third Street Bridge. Third Street and he's bridge. on foot. And the other dude's in the yeah. car and says, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Bare, barefoot. He's the same thing. Barefoot. He's not wearing shoes. And he is going to outrun yeah. a car. And there's to get to Third Street from Hollywood and Los Palmas. Listen, if this was normal LA and there was traffic on any of these streets, maybe I'd buy it. But like, yeah. but there, these streets are empty. This is the emptiest LA has ever been. Yeah, I, I do. Then they're in Silver Lake at some point, like right yeah. after that. Th- this is not only is it LA completely empty, but it's LA empty and the streets are soaking wet. It's like it's almost yeah. like somebody blocked off all the streets and then watered them down beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what they did. <laughs> I honestly was fine with the movie up until the fight scene. Yeah. And the, the third street, the third street from Hollywood and Los Palmas and the fight scene, I was like, you you lost me. It's not good for me to watch this movie uh, 33 years after it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was good until yeah, the, fight scene. the um the let's get the flock out of here line. And that's oh my and God, that's I when that. I realized how much of this the the humor in this movie is just like corny dad jokes. <laughs> and, and I feel like this, the second one is funnier, but but this one, I, I don't even know. Maybe the second one isn't funnier, because I thought this one was funny before I watched it, and then I was like, oh, so, it's really not that funny. These are all really bad jokes. You know, like this It's is almost like they were too old for this shit then, but then society got <laughs> too old for their shit now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think that's a great stopping point, and I think we should move on to our new segment, <laughs> Top 4, okay. where... I tell you guys an actor, and without looking at IMDb, you take turns guessing what their top four movies that they are known for are, according to IMDb. All right, let's do this. I'm terrible at this game. Uh, first, we're going to do uh, Mel Gibson, because his was better. Every single week that we that we do one of these shows, I look at the, every actor's IMDb page. I look at every single one of them. So I should know some of these answers and i am so fucking bad at this game it's embarrassing all right let's go let's do it wait uh, carl carl gets to guess too right oh yeah yeah he's gonna okay. he's gonna go first because he's our guest all right so you gotta guess what the top four mel gibson movies are according to imdb okay let's see fourth uh what women want definitely ride number one <laughs> hit hit man uh no no way that is that is um, wrong oh okay okay Hold on, wait a second. Oh, I don't. I, I just no, guess one. No, we take one. turns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so so okay. now Harris, okay. Harris, you go. All right. The only one that I'm sure of. If it's if Braveheart isn't on there, I will fucking retire from this podcast. It's got to be Braveheart. <laughs> Mel, what is what is is he right? That's provocative. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You're you're correct. Oh God. That's the only one I know. Uh, I'll get every other one wrong. Uh, a movie that I've watched in uh, several different classrooms, including a community college, The Patriot. No, that is incorrect. What? That is incorrect. No patriot on this list. Okay, I got you. I got you. Give me my prize right now, cause this is about to wow them. Give me my prize. Waterworld. He's not in that. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> That's a Kevin Costner movie. Who's in it? Oh, okay. <laughs> You're confusing your. Close I understand though. the confusion though. <laughs> those those are similar. Those are guys in a similar range. <laughs> this is the problem with this game is that it's so hard <laughs> to figure out. Like once you get past like the main ones, it's so hard to figure anything out. All right, I'm going next. I'm guessing. Oh, I should guess a lethal weapon, but I don't know which one of the four to guess. Um, yes, you're right in your instinct maybe here. It's, maybe it's three of them, so maybe I I've got a three and four chance. Maybe I should just guess one. I'm going against the grain, and I'm guessing payback. <laughs> Which is a good movie. Sorry, oh. that is wrong. That is very wrong. Okay, I'm going to guess Lethal Weapon 2. Ah, oh, so close. But so wrong. Oh. Right. But I will give you one more chance. Give me my prize now. I hope my trophy is oiled up. I hope my trophy is oiled up, ready to go. I hope you're handling it with oiled? gloves. <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind that's just it's shaped like a bowling pin but that's not what you have to use it for <laughs> I'm, um, right. one Mel more guess Gibson. Mel Gibson Passion of the Christ baby oh, that's, a good one. <laughs> that's a good one that is a good one yeah I'm sorry no that is incorrect alright I only have one strike right now so I'm doing good I'm in the lead um, 
and I am going to guess Lethal Weapon. It's either three or four. I bet it's not the first one. It's Lethal Weapon three. That's provocative. Yeah, right. you got it. Mel says it's correct. <laughs> it's probably Lethal Weapon three, four, and one. Those are the remaining. Those are the remaining movies. <laughs> so so far we've got Braveheart and Lethal Weapon three. The next two are harder. Are they? Uh, uh, but le- are all of these actor credits? Or they is... are all actor credits. Fuck. Yes. Because I was gonna do Apocalypto, but clearly now I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. Um, so let's get one more guess uh, from everyone, and then we'll. we'll lethal call Weapon it. Four. That is incorrect. But you said it was not a Lethal Weapon, so it's something else. Okay. Yeah, there me... are no more Lethal Weapons on the board. Oh. Give me my trophy. <laughs> I hope it's oiled up and warmed up. I hope it's warm. <laughs> I hope it's sitting in the stove, keeping my trophy warm because I'm about to win the game right now. Mad Max. Oh, yeah, that's. No! No? Oh, Oh, my God. (laughs) I don't know no more movies. I'm trying not to cheat. Yeah, exactly. I'm in front of of my camera, Um, my my computer. I'll I'll give you guys a hint and I'll say that these these answers suck. (laughs) They will not. You will not be like, oh. All right. Um, So, is it. So, wait. Seeing as I've I've already successfully guessed two of these and I'm in the lead, I would just like um, to rule out a couple things for the group. It's not a, the the remaining movies aren't Mad Max or Lethal Weapon movies. That is correct. Oh fuck, Jesus. Um, all right. uh, let's see if I can give you a hint. Guess let's Beaver. See. Oh yeah, Beaver. We got the man without the f- without a face. We got like his. He's he's gotten done some new ones like dragged across concrete and um, um, there's what's the one um, ransom um the the one he did with Julia Roberts. Oh, guess ransom. Guess ransom. Guess ransom. Yeah. Okay, I'm guessing ransom. Guess ransom. That's provocative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ransom. Okay. <laughs> yep. And here's here's the hint. Ready? The next, the final movie is also directed by Richard Donner. Oh, give me my, give me my trophy. I hope it's hot and ready, like a Little Caesars pizza. Give me my trophy. I already know what it is. Go tart. I'm doing. Uh, yeah, you just go. Uh, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um. Uh, <laughs> enemy of the state. He doesn't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yes, shit. Superman tart. That's also uh, Superman 2. You should just fucking smile and blow me! Because I deserve it! Colin, do you have a guess? I don't have a guess. Let's just quit. I don't, I don't think we're going to get this re- last one. <laughs> yeah, the last one was uh, Conspiracy. That's theory. the one with Julia Roberts oh, that I was yeah. thinking of. Oh. Yep. Oh, and Patrick Stewart. I remember and Patrick that. Stewart. Patrick Stewart's a bad guy in that. Wow, yeah. Man, that Mel Gibson's was a made a lot of good movies that if I, I bet if I watched them, I'd be like, oh, this isn't actually that good. <laughs> um, should we talk about what we learned in this movie? Or do you want to do more? Yeah, did we learn guessing? anything? I, I learned some stuff. I learned that if you um, have something that vaguely resembles a policeman's badge, you can just run around and do anything. It doesn't matter if you're barefoot with a machine <laughs> gun. The other cops will just get out of your way as long as you wave a, a badge-like thing in their face. I learned that Tyler, the creator, started in <laughs> movies. That's good. Let's spread that. Yeah. I saw him once uh, at the Swingers Diner on uh, Beverly. He like, he like looked at us weird, and then he like got in his expensive sports car and peeled out. <laughs> That's the life, baby. That's the I'm life. Sure he did. And, and Colin shook <laughs> yeah. his fist at him. He's like, Tyler, the creator. It was weird that he was there alone. Like celebrities that big, you don't you don't usually see them alone, like ever. You know, like in public. I think it's good that he doesn't have an entourage. I think that makes him more relatable. It's lonely at the top. Yeah. I mean, not to me because I take my entourage everywhere. But <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know who he was at the time. I was, like, my friend was like, "That's Tyler the Creator," and I was like, "That is good." I mean, I, re- I recognize the <laughs> what name. What does he create? I recognize yeah. the name, but you guys know me. I clearly don't. Yeah. Know. I don't know anybody. <laughs> so Harris doesn't know who that is. <laughs> I, I if the music came out in the last thirty years, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he did a whole like sketch comedy show that was like a little bit like Jackass, but not like Jackass. It was good. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah. It, it had it had some good moments, I think. Yeah. I learned that there are some good cops in the world, <laughs> and they're all in this film. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they refuse to shoot bad guys. Oh, my God. That reminds me of my, my least favorite line in this entire movie. 
there are no heroes left in the world just before Riggs comes kicking in the door. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. can you get a little more on the nose? Like, there's yeah, no way some good guy would outsmart us and, <laughs> and take us all down right now. <laughs> yeah, there's some stuff in this that's a little corny at times. Uh, I didn't learn much. I mean, this movie validated a lot of things for me. I, I wanted to drink some eggnog after I saw that eggnog <laughs> scene. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I bought some like, yesterday. Mm, warm eggnog. <laughs> yeah, room temperature. I, yeah, I just want to feel that gumminess in the back of my throat that you can't quite spit or swallow out. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Ew. I've never really drank eggnog, and, like, no one has ever said anything to, like, turn me on to it. No one's ever been like, oh, Colin, I really think you're going to like eggnog because it tastes good in some way. They've always just been like, oh, we drink eggnog here. I could see how you might not want some. And like, how do you? How do people get started into eggnog? Like, what's Colin, the gateway to Have you to ever eggnog? have you ever been drinking milk and just thought, you know what, this could use booze. <laughs> it could use being room temperature and full of nutmeg. <laughs> like, if you've ever had no. that feeling, then then eggnog's for you. Everyone else, it could use a little flour, some thickening agent. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. And you know what uh, I like? If this just sort of coated my whole mouth and body as I drank it. <laughs> I remember when I when I was a kid, we used to drink eggnog, and I was like, I don't like this. But the adults used to drink it up because they was adding bourbon to it yeah. Yeah. or brandy or whatever. And I remember when I finally got old enough to have, like, alcoholic eggnog, and I was like, this shit still sucks. <laughs> yeah, why are we still drinking this? Yeah, no, I, I always used to like eggnog when I was a kid because it was sweet. And it was like, oh, it's like candy. It's like milk, but it's got it's sweet, and it's just like it's almost like drinking a milkshake. And then I realized – no, what I really want is like a vanilla milkshake. I don't want egg yeah. <laughs> like this flavor is not good and the texture isn't good and everything about it's bad. And every Christmas, people go nuts about eggnog and start pushing eggnog at me. And I'm just like, no, 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 keep your eggnog. I will not have it. You know, milkshakes just make me think of how disgusting fast food restaurants are because like that's the place where like you're going to get like the gross stuff. It's like the milkshake machine never gets cleaned. Yeah, and that's I'm why sorry, the milkshakes I, are so delicious. I probably should have held that one back. I, I didn't. We didn't need that comment. In that our is a hot take. Here. And I, am, <laughs> yeah, I agree and, with Harris. And I feel like fast food restaurants are the place where I order the most milkshakes. Because I'm like, ooh, milkshakes. Maybe I'll just get a milkshake and yeah. fries. That's safe at every Whoa. fast food place. Like a Jack in the Box milkshake machine. It's got like a couple different shoes in there and like a fucking piece of animal shit. No, and, and this is why this disgusting. is all. I, it's one of my favorite things. Jack in the Box. They put a cherry on top. <laughs> They're not fucking around. Have you guys ever had uh, the Neapolitan shake from In and Out? No. no. I, I would say all three flavors. I would say strawberry is my favorite of the milkshake flavors, and that's a that's a little bit different. Well, you got a lot of bad milkshake takes here, Colin. And <laughs> I have to say that like I would have accepted chocolate. I think vanilla is the correct answer, but strawberry is definitely not. Um, you know what? Do, you know Look, what does a good um, milkshake? Top Round does a pistachio milkshake that's really good. You know, Top Round on like oh Obrey yeah, and, uh, I'm Obrey. right by there. They yeah, do that. I'm yes, getting that. you should go to Top Round and get a pistachio milkshake. It's fucking delicious. I'm like five minutes from there. I mean, don't tell the listeners where I live. <laughs> do it right after we wrap here. Just, oh, yeah. just jump over the Third Street Bridge. Cut it, yeah, yeah cut run barefoot over the Third Street Bridge. We'll be right there at Top Round. Are we ready to do our final rankings? Yes, let's do it. Um, should right. I go first? Go first? Yeah, go for it. I will go. I will go first since Lethal Weapon was my choice. I will lead out our initial Timothy Dolphin rankings. Um, so I've seen this movie so many times, and I still love it. But I think it's like only 50% based on the quality of the film and 50% based on nostalgia. Um, for a funny movie, it takes itself way too seriously. There's a lot of like unironic machismo that hasn't aged well. And the plot has all sorts of like logistical problems. And the epic fight scene at the end isn't as impressive as it was when I was 12. Um, and I also realized that a lot of the humor and personality that I love about the Lethal Weapon movies doesn't come in until a second movie um so on the other hand boobs guns explosions wailing electric guitars this is like the ultimate 12 year old boy movie and the 12 year old boy in me still loves it and gives it a very biased semith seven timothy dolphins nice nice it's a it's a good score i think yeah that's that's the score I was gonna it's do. Middle of the road, but, but I, don't, I don't know if I should say. <laughs> you know, that. seven middle of the road. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right dead center. Dead center, right between <laughs> one and ten. <laughs> yeah. Um, um uh, Harris, you made me realize that? that we we didn't even mention the music really. Um, we talked about the saxophone a little bit, but Eric Clapton, does another uh, outed racist. <laughs> Do you guys know that about <laughs> <Yes>. him? <laughs> yeah, very very racist. Eric Clapton on the electric guitar here. David Sanborn, <laughs> as far as we know, not a racist and a fairly well known jazz musician, played the saxophone for the uh, Murtaugh cues. Sure, I'm sure he's a David racist, Sanborn. Though. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, David Sanborn was a saxophonist on. First few seasons of SNL. Yes, he was. I believe so. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Damn. We're getting horny over here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Colin, for, just for that, Everyone. you get to go next. What's your Timothy Dolphin? <laughs> <thing? laughs> uh, um, so, like, I think what I don't like about this movie is I feel like there's two different movies going on. There's the movie about the relationship between Danny Glover's character and Mel Gibson's character. And there's the detective story about finding out about who killed this woman. And I don't get the synergy. Uh, I feel like other movies, like, yeah, there's two different stories going on. Like, But at some point, there's a moment where everything comes together. And you realize both of these stories are telling the same story in some way i don't feel that ever happens and i feel even less that that happens when the final scene is this weird fist fight thing and yeah the other thing that's bad about the fist fight is um like it the uh there's a plant and payoff to it in the script where when danny glover first meets mel gibson he's like oh i hear you do uh karate and whatever or like martial arts and he's just like, yeah, um, everyone hates me. And then, you know, like, that's it. Then, like, hours later, we've got, oh, well, this means it's time to have this fist fight that would, yes, get all of them fucking fired. They would all be fired. Every single one of those fucking cops would be fired if they fucking conducted that fucking fist fight in a front yard. Eh, um, I, think, I think we've seen how hard it is to fire cops for doing stupid shit. So, I mean, they would all you, be reprimanded, you, and it would look very bad. You have a strong point. You make a strong, you make a strong, strong point. I think they'd be fired for not killing him. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's, yeah. That is almost, that is exactly what I was about enough. to say. I was about to say that. I'm Boys, so you had one you job to do. <laughs> <laughs> the police union would just reject the entire group of them. You didn't murder that man? Yeah. You're, you're saying you used all these police re- resources to do something other than take a life. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Uh, fuck. Um, so anyways, yeah, I just... It takes me out of it to me. Especially, like, the detective story, I feel like it's a, a little out of order. Like... Um, they say, okay, we know she was with someone and then she committed suicide. And we know that that person probably poisoned her. And instead they go first to investigate the, um, whoever's been paying the bill for the, uh, which I mean, yeah, like that kind of makes sense because it's based on the evidence they have. But to me, like the story would be, okay. We need to find the last person who was with her alive. That's like a lot of the way detective stories go. You know what I mean? Like, are you nitpicking okay, the died. elements of the detective? Because I feel like this, 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 this isn't really like a whodunit kind of. I don't know if the boobs, and explosions, and gunfights tipped you off, but that's not really the. I don't think that's what they were going for. Nothing tipped me off. I don't know. I don't know anything. As um, usual, nothing has tipped you off. Yes. Um, yeah, I just think it's like two different stories and they don't bring it together with synergy. And yeah, I think, I don't know, we compare it to Die Hard a lot. I feel like, yeah, there's there's a story about John McClane reconciling with his wife and then a story about him fighting against these bad guys. And at some point, you know, there, there's a synergy there where it's like both of these struggles are kind of the same for him. And... Yeah, in this movie, it still feels like two different things are going on. These two guys are, like, becoming friends, and also they're fighting these guys. So, yeah. Um, It's a seven. Sorry uh, I took so long, but it's a seven for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that took way too long. Timothy Dolphin. Seven Timothy Dolphin. (laughs) Yeah, I was waiting for you to say that. Yeah, my bad. Um, Tart, you want to give it a go? 
Yeah, I'll give it a Joe. Hello, hey Joe. I'll give it a go. <laughs> uh, I just now saw this movie in full for the first time as a 31-year-old man. I did not like it. <laughs> I like Danny Glover. I like parts of it, but I did not like the movie as a, as a whole. Although I respect what it has done for the culture, uh, it did it, it. It had some cool moments. I'm not a huge action guy. I know that's probably weird, but I'm not. I like I like comedy. It had a couple of moments that made me laugh. Uh, I always love a, I Always loved. I'm getting too old for this shit. Uh, that's great. A couple of the L.A. specifics threw me off a little bit, but also it was cool to see L.A. in the before I was born. So like that's uh, that was cool. See things that aren't here anymore, things that now look different than what they looked like back then. There was a couple times where they were standing in front of like buildings that I know are now a very futuristic Walgreens. <laughs> 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 so like that 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 was cool to see. That's always cool to see. Uh, I'm gonna give it uh, five Timothy Dolphin. Nice. The the actual middle middle of the, of the road. road. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, we're talking about being middle of the road, and I feel like I'm right there with you guys, driving in the, you know, not the fast lane, not the slow lane, but like the, you know, the middle of the road lane. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I mean, this movie, I can appreciate, you know, what it did exactly. You know, kind of what Tart said that with for the culture. Um, this movie, I, I don't, I think it was technically fine. Um, there was nothing really that, uh, seemed dated to me or, you know, that I, I thought didn't work in a technical sense. Um, I, I really like the dialogue. I, I like R rated movies where like people talk like real, they curse. Um, you know, this movie had drugs and nudity and explosions and guns, all the things we talked about already. Um, not much really took me out. The only thing, uh, things I think that bothered me were the ending. Uh, I really don't like that fight scene. It's totally unrealistic, and uh, it just takes you right out. And then, like, the music, I think. I mean, I know the music goes with the other movies, too, as this uh, goes further into the future. But I just feel I can't help but be taken out every time I hear that sweet, sweet saxophone. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, I enjoyed this movie. Uh, you know, it has a, a couple of corny things going on, like we mentioned. Uh, I'm not saying anything new here. We've kind of talked about all this. But uh, I think I'm going to give it six Timothy Dolphins. It's like you're in the middle of our middle of the road. Exactly. I told you I was right yes. there with you. Mm. Um, do you guys remember there was a website years ago called realultimatepower.com? And it yeah. was like just it was yeah, like a this, random I, I don't remember what it was, but I I, I It was like a humor website all about this like it was about ninjas and how cool ninjas were. And it was basically oh, written yeah. like in the persona of like a, a teen boy that ninjas were really cool and ninjas would fuck up pirates if ninjas and pirates got into a fight. You yeah, gotta watch that, out for pirates. That was the um that was the beginning of the whole ninja versus pirate fad. Right, thing exactly. That went on. And, and yeah. but they used to like they used to be like one of the things on it was when they'd write their little fan fiction things, it would be like some ninja would do something totally badass and a guitar would wail in the background. <laughs> yeah. and I was every time I hear the electric guitar wail in this movie, I just think of realultimatepower.com. I'm just like meow. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> RealUltimatePower.com makes me think of the the Chuck Norris jokes era. Do you yes, guys remember that? Exactly. It was sort of it was Chuck almost Norris, like a yeah. similar um, brand of of humor. I, I also have a story. I met him in real life too, or sort of did. I, I brought him a milkshake. Actually, oh I literally God. served Chuck Norris a milkshake. Wow. What flavor was Holy it? Holy shit! After we talked, um, I it, I'm thinking vanilla. I'm pretty sure we had only chocolate and vanilla, and vanilla is what I remember. You would. I brought him the milkshake because, like, no one else wanted to serve him because he was, like, a dick to everyone. (laughs) I've heard that about him. There's something about the martial arts stars. I think they're all just (laughs) assholes in real life to people. Because they know they can beat people up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be it. They're like, no, literally. if if only there um, weren't these laws restraining me, my fists would find your face and make you bring the milkshake faster. (laughs) 
and don't you dare bring me strawberry and inferior <laughs> flavor. Yeah, it was the place that was like a restaurant and a movie theater. So when he went up to the box office, he's like, I want like, you know, a private seat or whatever in, in here and like blah, blah, blah. And she's like, okay, we're really busy right now. This is what we can offer you. And the and he said to this girl, do you know who I am? And she was like, oh, fuck. I once, and she did not uh, know who he was. I once worked on a set with uh, Dennis Leary for, on his show Rescue Me. Do you guys remember that mm-hmm. show? Uh-huh. And I saw him flip out on everyone uh, on the set. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Uh, Damn. Some PA or something. Like he's got some anger issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, first of all, it was like 105 degrees outside. It was like the middle of the summer. And uh, everyone was like standing outside in this like brutal heat. And he just like, I guess that's why he was so annoyed too. But some PA or whatever, like left their walkie talkie on. And like in the middle of a take, it went like, bleep, mm. you know, like. And yeah. he flipped out and was like, what the fuck? Like, you know, <laughs> just like screaming at people. And he's like, Damn. he said something weird that I always remember. He was like, you think this is bad? He's like, try being on one of Clint Eastwood's sets. So uh, I, I don't know. Well. <laughs> I don't know what. Clint Eastwood some, actually runs some secondhand Clint Eastwood shade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clint Eastwood actually runs a tight ship. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> The, the uh, <laughs> never does more than two takes of any shot. Yeah, <laughs> that's on. that's my type of shit. Yeah, he only works as eight a lazy hours a day. Actor? They wrap by six every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 As a, well, as he, a lazy actor, I'm like two takes. Hell yeah, let's yeah. get the fuck out of here. Yeah, <laughs> of course he would probably be furious if a walkie-talkie ruined one of those takes. So I think that's that's the the payoff is that you know you can you can do it fast, but you got to get it right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he would never end a movie the way Lethal Weapon ends because he would have to get those guys off of his lawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I got Carl to laugh. Thank All God. Right. All, All right. right. <laughs> All right. Carl, thank you so much for uh, coming and being our guest. We hope you had fun. Thanks for having me, guys. Carl, you got uh, anything thanks, Carl. to uh, plug? Uh, yeah, you can listen to me weekly on The Flagra Ones on Patreon. It's a show I host with a couple of dudes, and we talk basketball. And it ain't it ain't serious basketball, but we talk basketball and we joke around and have a good time. And uh, yeah, that that's it. I'm I'm what in the you, house. What do you guys do in the office? Board in the house, and I'm in the house bored. Uh, still talk shit. <laughs> nice. I, I make the fans mad because I talk a lot about the Clippers and they call me a homer. And I'm like, yeah, everybody who likes a team is a homer. Yeah, sure. Clowns. Yeah. As long as you acknowledge it. Sometimes yeah. me and Harris will talk basketball and Matt will be like, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, this podcast gets real quiet on Matt's end when we start talking yeah. NBA. <laughs> it just goes a little too deep for me. I'm only uh, base, baseline knowledge. Yeah. Um, cool. Tart, do you have a, are you a Twitterer or can like people follow you? Oh, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. You can follow me on the old IG at Damn It Carl, D A M M I T C A R L. Two M's. Nice. No N's. Awesome. Damn it, Carl. Well, is there anything else that we forgot to say about this this lovely I movie? I think we've I think we've done it. I think we've nailed it. We've got a perfect usually I, I just like want to give tr- one more shout out to Danny Glover. He's great. And I loved him in Lonesome Dove. I know you guys haven't seen that, but it's great. No, you know what I liked him in? What was the one with Dennis Quaid where he was like the um serial killer and uh switchback? Oh, oh switchback. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't even know that. Yeah. Deep I also loved him as the president in 2012. Oh God! Was, oh yeah, that. that's right. That was on his top four, actually. <laughs> See, this oh, we didn't Col- even do his top. Colin four. really yeah. wanted to do Glover as the top four. <laughs> I believe his top four was three Lethal Weapon movies and uh, and that 2012. You know what's Something interesting like that. that I that I happened to notice as I was uh, scrolling through the IMDb's of all these people, everyone in Danny Glover's family, their top four is four Lethal Weapon movies. <laughs> 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 I just kept on seeing. Uh, oh, all lethal weapons. Yep, never been in anything else. My uh, right. my stepdad. He sat next to uh, Danny Glover on a plane once, and he always tells it like like it's a story, <laughs> but it's literally <laughs> like just it's that. Story. <laughs> it's like we literally just that. Well, did you know? I once sat next to Danny Glover on a plane. It's like that's pretty sweet. And he's like, he, it was. <laughs> he folded his he folded his legs once, and his shoe almost brushed against my knee, but it didn't. It was a moment. We shared it. <laughs> 
I, I still talk that. about I still talk about being on an airplane with Gallagher in the nineties. You guys remember Gallagher? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many watermelons Hell was he yeah. carrying? How many water- watermelons was he allowed in his carry ons on that airplane? <laughs> they were all stowed away. I, I, you know, they were under the plane. <laughs> Wait, so did he carry on the hammer? I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> no, nothing. The hammer stays on him at all times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What if a watermelon comes at him on the plane? This is just a matter of safety. <laughs> the first couple rows of coach have to wear, like, a tarp over them. <laughs> yeah. A protective tarp. You see tarp. a flight attendant with a, a melon on top of a little cart, <laughs> and she starts coming his way, and everybody freaks out and tries to get out of the way. You know what's funny? There must have been more to Gallagher's bits than smashing watermelons because people really love those things, but that's all. That's all he's known for. Sorry, this is your legacy, buddy. Smashing watermelons. <laughs> yep. I've watched his specials before when I was younger, and there's, like, there's like a good 20 minutes before he starts b- busting stuff up. <laughs> Where he's mostly just talking about, he's making jokes about how he's going to fuck up watermelons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Basically, wait, oh, I'm going to get, get out of here, people. Yeah, I remember it, a lot of it was, like, scaring people. Like, he would, like, lunge forward with, with the hammer, and people would be like, ah, and think he's going to smash it, but then he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He would hold on. It was a simpler time when a man lunging at you with a sledgehammer was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right. I'm going to let some sweet saxophone take us out. Uh, nice. Carl, thanks again. Nicely done. All right. Yeah, thanks again, thanks, Carl. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for having me.